Hey everyone, this is 372 Pages, we'll never get back. Michael J. Nelson here, and believe it or not, I'm on a microphone again with Connor Listoka. <laughs> Connor, how are you? Uh, What's going on, man? We talked like eight hours ago. <laughs> <It's>, <laughs> I know, I couldn't even fake that. Uh, yeah, I know, it's like we have the tin can struck between our, tea, our tree house or something. Yeah, yeah, There's, it's... Uh, it, you're, it's Bart and uh, what's his friend? Millhouse. Uh, Millhouse. That's right. You're the walkie talk Newman. I, my my world is so messed up. <laughs> wow. Bart and Newman would be a good pair. Hello, Millhouse. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So this is the uh, podcast where Connor and I talk about bad books. Yeah. It's then, uh you know the, uh, a lot of people are saying like you know this is your time this is your this is your time to write your King Lear this is your time to you know get that project you know out of your head and onto the page now that everyone else has this free time but it's like we're, we're just we're still reading bad books we're still reading Dan Brown like that's what the uh, that's where that energy that could be going to uh, you know compose our symphony is going. <laughs> Yeah, there's a uh, a famous, I don't know if this is anecdotal, but one of the saints or something like St. Anselm or something, one of the early patrons of the church, he said, what would you do if Jesus came back today? And he said, I would go back to tending my garden, meaning I'm fine. <laughs> and we would say, I would go back to reading Dan Brown's yes. Digital Fortress. Yes. I would keep refreshing <laughs> Dwight David Thrash's Amazon page to see if he had released a 14th volume. <laughs> yes. So that's what we're doing. Yeah. But hey. I stand by it. Yeah, why not? It's, you know, the, we're lucky that things have not changed uh, too much for us. So glad that we can yeah. keep doing this. Because honestly, you know, if there was a, uh, you know, <laughs> this would be the first thing to go if I was in any sort of like perilous situation. Like, you know, no, I'm not going to read a bad book. I'm going to, I'm going to like, you know, Obviously, go out and I'm pound the pavement. my mind yeah. to higher things. Yeah. Obviously. <laughs> so, yeah. Nope. Glad we can do this together, everybody. Uh, but yeah, and, we're re- uh, Dan Brown's Digital Fortress is the current book on the docket, and we're, uh, I don't know, like a, a tenth of the way through it at this point in time. We, we read 37 chapters for this time. Um, do you find in your own mind that when I go to say I'm reading Digital Fortress, I can't help doing di- 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 Digital Fortress for some reason? Just, mm. uh, know, there's some 80 song or something <laughs> stuck in my head. Sure. I don't know what it is. Max Headroom kind of? Yeah, that's probably it. That's yeah, probably there's it. a uh, the uh, the RZA, the leader of the Wu Tang Clan, released a of uh, course. Of co- how, how, how dare you, <laughs> Saint Anselm uh, RZA? Uh, <laughs> but he released an album in probably probably right around this actually 1999. I would say Bobby Digital. That was his superhero mm. alter ego. Uh, e- alter ego. So it had a uh, digital was having a moment. I think at this point in time. Was that roughly around the time that Garth Brooks became uh, Chris Gaines? Chris Gaines. <laughs> <laughs> that might have been like, like a couple years earlier, but I think it was definitely inspired and definitely as unsuccessful as that. It was a big wow. joke. It was like uh, the Wu Tang could do no wrong in the late '90s, and then Bobby Digital. So we had a Bobby Digital poster on our uh, sophomore year in college apartment. Is there was there any hot takes that like no this is their best stuff this, oh, is, this I is the mean, new direction yeah I I I am sure that there was someone out there saying that but no one took that seriously and no one <laughs> no one would take that seriously there was supposed to be a movie to go along with it like I think uh, Bobby Digital the movie yes and I don't think uh, I think that's like uh, the clown who cried or Corman's Fantastic Four I think RZA was smoking too many honey dips at that point in time. <laughs> Ah, uh, well, look, do we have, we have all the departments. Of course, yeah. Oh, yes. People have been uh, super engaged, I think, with all the downtime. Got a ton of fan fiction, some usable fan fiction, <laughs> and we got a ton of emails and uh, plenty of dumb sentences because there is no shortage of, of dumb sentences or things to, uh, to compose lengthy email screeds about with this one. Wow. Uh, how many uh, would you say that you, you got? Um, <laughs> you open up Gmail and, uh, you, you go to the next page, which is, you know, 50, I think is per page on the default setting. And then I'm like, my God, it goes on to the second one. So, <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, thank you for taking that on. Yeah. You know, the, like we said, nothing but time. You can only watch so much Joe Exotic. Uh, did you finish that? One more to go. Oh, you do? Okay. Yeah. All right. Then I won't say anything. I won't, yeah, I won't recommend it, I would say, uh, especially since the moment has passed. But, you know, it was interesting for the time. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I uh, <laughs> I ended up, well, all right. I said I wasn't going to say anything, and now I'm just talking about it. Forget it. All right. <laughs> what, did you so, look, look into it and just become disgusted with the amorality of it? Uh, that's part, that was part of it. <laughs> 
part. It's just like, you know, dirt bags, uh, you know, you know, the saying turtles all the way down, dirt bags yeah. all the way down yep. doesn't make necessarily make for a wholesome. <laughs> <laughs> view well, experience. I don't think anyone was claiming that it was the, uh, you know, the next, uh, this is us, but, uh, yeah, that's Lauren's, I think, problem with it as well. You know, you tie, you, you pile that on animal abuse, uh, voyeurism. It's, you know, oh, that I'm th- all those things. <laughs> yeah. I'm right? totally yeah that's why that. I started watching it, but yeah. And then all of a sudden there's all these dirt bags around. I'm like, guys, I'm trying to watch animal abuse here. <laughs> oh, well, I don't think there's any animal abuse in Digital Fortress. So we can, uh, I, should we recap about where we are? I think, I think they recap pretty much at the start of chapter 10. Um, Strathmore, he tends to recap every couple chapters. <laughs> yes. Well, he is only dealing, she only has 170 IQ. So you never know when her might be, her mind might be, uh, you know, doing a Homer Simpson and having cartoon characters playing the fiddle in it or something. Yeah, St- Strathmore's like uh, uh, friends or something. He only exists on a couch in a coffee shop, yes. and uh, <laughs> well, he just sits in his office. And <laughs> when you're that thick fleshed, it's uh, you know, you, you, you... <laughs> it's true. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So yeah. Uh, so where are we? There's a uh, uh, the NSA. The plot is the NSA is upset. It has to track down a code. That a disgruntled employee mm-hmm. from Japan has unleashed on the world that will uh, cause the NSA to not be able to spy on everyone on the planet. And they're gravely upset about this and they must stop it. Yes. Yes. And so the- they're searching in Seville for the, the guy who did it. He died of a heart attack mm-hmm. in Seville. NC he- Tenkado. Yes. Who I always, always want to pronounce it as Enrico Palazzo. <laughs> <laughs> and I have been unable to pronounce it at all. <laughs> uh, it's my, my, I, everyone has an Ogden and that is my Ogden. Yeah. So well. go ahead, <laughs> make up memes about me. I'm fine with that. Yeah, I'm fine with it too. Uh, but yeah, so they, they sort of explained this. Uh, do we have Susan, the, uh, the uh, goddess, uh, like, you know, swimsuit model slash genius uh, code breaker. And her uh, fiance, David, is the one who's over in Spain inv- investigating uh, Ensai Tancado. And we sort of get the, the the speculation she had was that they might have, NSA might have tried to kill him. But they say, uh, Straithmore, her boss, says like, no, no, it wasn't, uh, you know, it wasn't us. He says a, a defective heart could kill him. Just like that, is what Susan says. It seemed too convenient. Strathmore shrugged. Weak heart, combine it with the heat of Spain. And you sort of get this going forward is that they, uh, all the characters in this book seem to think that Spain, the collective royal Spain, is like going into Death Valley at the, uh, at the end of July. Yeah, I, I couldn't. <laughs> it's I incredible. did not know that that was Spain's reputation. That its heat was killing people left and right, and so if you died, like just well, yeah, I mean, of course, right? Spanish yeah, heat. Yeah, it is. It's, uh, but it, you didn't know that because that's not a thing. Like I looked it up, and it's sort of like uh, you know, Spain has like beaches where people go. I'm sure year round. And uh, Seville, I looked it up, and the high in July was you know 95. And I can't imagine it's as, you know, humid as, you know, the southern United States is at that point in time where <laughs> people seem to be able to get by during these summer months. But they seem to, they make those palazzos to try to uh, kind of collect the heat and kill people. Is that what they... <laughs> yes, yes. The, the tile is... an enticing fountain in the middle of it so that you have to go across the tile. Yeah, it's um, like a video game level. Yeah. <laughs> um, so this is chapter 10. And my first note was... Uh, uh, turns out we we weren't wrong with our early interpretations of Strathmore. Strathmore's gravelly voice. Oh wow! Nice. Get in here. Get in here. Sis. <laughs> I need to tell you a little bit more about uh, this this code breaking stuff. <laughs> the greasy, thick flesh. What yeah. is this? Uh... Yeah, thick fleshed, and and I I imagine that means the the jowls are sort of doing the or making the gravelly voice also sort of blubbery. But he's, I mean, obviously hard of gold. He's right, yes, of course. Swimsuit models, uh, the greatest uh, man father. she's ever known. Yes, um, he's calm. This calmness is becomes quite a theme in this. Yeah, because as we noted last time, Susan is still sort of like jerking around in her chair, like uh, like Charlie Callis throughout the uh, throughout the rest of this, just because everything she's, he says surprises her or shocks her, or makes frowns, her... <laughs> um, you know, uh, sideways smile, lots of weird things happening. But I think what's number one, and I looked it up, word counts. Take a guess. How many times do people chuckle? Oh boy! <laughs> in the in the book, forty. Uh, uh, not not bad. Twenty four times. Wow. Okay. And that's just the word chuckled. Yes. So, 
Yeah, so chuckle. It made it a chuckle, huh? Yeah, so people... Uh, it just doesn't strike me as the NSA is not terribly serious because they're always going. <laughs> right. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I guess when you're just you know when you're when you're engaging with Dan Brown dialogue, you need some sort of way to break up those p- punchy sentences. So she says Bigelman safe or something that probably provokes a knowing chuckle. I bet a lot of them are knowing. <laughs> <laughs> um, this made me wonder if Strathmore is OK. Uh, he says. We've got a good lead. Hankato made numerous public announcements that he was working with a partner. I think he hoped it would discourage software firms from doing any harm or trying to steal his key. He threatened that if there was any foul play, his partner would publish the key. Did did we not cover this at yes, length yes. in the last chapter? My note was, let's recap everything. Strathmore? Do you, do you want to just kind of tap him on the side and go, are, are you... You, we just talked about this, right? Like we just talked about it's this. It's insane. It's like a previously on Game of Thrones thing that runs for a, a minute before, but that's because you had a a week in between episodes to forget it. This was on the next page. Yes, <laughs> but yeah, I like he goes through all of that, and then cl- and then Susan nods and responds, "Clever." So it's as if she hadn't heard any of this either. It was it was a hundred percent covered in the previous uh, couple chapters. Again, editor, did you, <laughs> is that not oh. circled with a big greasy red pen, like uh, unnecessary, covered? <laughs> uh, but he goes on to say that, so this is the the standard, uh, you know, thriller plot where someone uh, tells a partner, like, you know, if you don't hear from me every hour, like, you know, you've got to you've got to go public. That means that they've taken me out. Um, and they they reveal that 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 silent partner in this whole thing is nicknamed North Dakota. Um, and so he she, she Susan says. Uh, North Dakota, obviously an alias of some sort. Again, genius. Uh, you know, what was it just she was only a genius compared to like Descartes or something last time, I think we realized. But and then well, but, I said about that North Dakota that she says obviously an alien and uh, like unless it's a stripper from Grand Forks. <laughs> yeah. I mean, good call. Yeah. High ranking NSA. Director. Welcome to the stage, North Dakota. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, yeah, that's but then but then but then so he says uh uh yes but as a precaution I ran an internet inquiry using North Dakota as a search <laughs> string. <laughs> so, you know, just dr- dressing that uh mundane thing up in the fanciest language you could imagine. I didn't think I'd find anything, but I turned up an email account. So, Lord knows how he's, you know, how he's filtering out all the legitimate, you know, millions of legitimate North Dakota um, I mean, I, I guess it is North Dakota, so there could be maybe like 10 results. Yeah, that's, that's true. <laughs> um, it is not a populous state, pretty yeah. much concentrated right there in Fargo. But then he says, uh, she says, uh, she instantly intuits this. She says, it's a trap. Ensai Tankado gave you North Dakota. He knew you'd run a search. Whatever information he's sending, he wanted you to find. It's a false trail. So once again, that's her genius intuition, just set, keeping us informed of that. But then he says, good instinct, Tr- Strathmore fired back, except for a couple things. I couldn't find anything under North Dakota. Weird. So I tweaked the search string. The account I found was under a variation, all one word, N Dakota. And so you you see that on the page, and so I assumed the next sequence was going to be the the 170 genius saying, "Oh, that's an anagram for Tankado." Like that's yeah, it's it's clearly it does not you know, come up. Yeah, <laughs> what what are we supposed to make of this? And it's not even like it's a long anagram. Like if you look at it, it's it. I'm bad with anagrams on the Mega Touch machine I'm bars. Terrible, I was always terrible, bad, terrible. and I was like, "Oh, that's yeah. huh, huh right there." It's like a, a couple letters are, are reversed. Yeah, what are they doing with this? I don't know. North They're Dakota. They're intentionally making their, their heroes just dumb as, as a post? Dumb as you dumber can... than a bag of hammers? <laughs> but she says, uh, North Dakota, she mused, her cryptological mind mulling over the possible meanings of the alias. It's it's bizarre. It's, <laughs> I don't uh, know what to make of it either. <laughs> selective dumbness. Um, but I have, uh, speaking of chuckling, I have a sonic challenge for you. Again, I wish right. we had the uh, yeah. soundboard with our the, bah, 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 <laughs> sonic challenge. There we go. That's our first one of these for this book. Strathmore chuckled, impressed, comma, impressed. Strathmore chuckled, comma, impressed. <laughs> oh, that's, that veered into Pepe Le Pew. Oh, wow. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> I was pointing the finger wag, too, of the, uh, the this guy finger wag. <laughs> 
All right, let me see if I can do it. Strathmore chuck. Okay, so it's gravelly. Oh. Uh, thick fleshed. Uh, you got to imagine a bead of sweat running down my jowly face. Mm -hmm. Or off the tip of his nose. Yeah, here we go. But also my sleeves are rolled up. I, um, okay, here we go. <laughs> <laughs> Gross. <laughs> well, who said who said it yeah. had to be a, an attractive chuckle? No, no, he's revolting. That's has been well established. He's the revolting greatest man she's ever known. And then a couple lines later, I noted this. Strathmore chuckled. <laughs> Jeez. So this time he was not impressed. Like that's <laughs> so I don't know how to do one where he's not impressed. Yeah, I guess that's it's more rueful, but I guess it's not rueful. It's just a straight up uh you know, she said something humorous. Because <laughs> <laughs> it's it's gravelly again. <laughs> All right. Uh but yeah, it goes into some uh it goes into some more uh tech speak about you now tracing, email tracing, which I, I assumed was wildly uh, oversimplified, but it did give us this gem. It said, when it came to discreet internet searches, <laughs> Susan Fletcher was the woman for the job. <laughs> Talk about damning with faint praise. Yeah, no kidding. <laughs> oh. Wow, discreet internet searches. It's like a uh, office space scenario where they ask someone what they do, who's just, you know, there, you know, punching the clock every day. They're like, well, you know, the boss has been known to... um when he needs, uh, you know, when he needs someone to do a uh, a discreet internet search, he uh, usually he comes to me. I mean, hasn't so asked me to do that in a while, but I he couldn't do the discreet search. I, well, I mean, I, I I taught him how to do it, but so, you know, he used so, to when he so needed he to, knows how to do a discreet internet search. Yes, but I would I did tell I told him how to do that when he first asked. So. Susan, what would you say <laughs> you do here? But, uh, you know, as a person who has run many a discreet internet search in my time. Uh, uh, certainly, with the uh, uh, the private window and oh, the yeah. Nord VPN fired up. Pure muscle memory to bring up that internet uh, incognito window. That is, <laughs> that is, you know, when you're looking for rigs or uh, all that sort of stuff, you, you know, there's no reason to have it in there. I have it in that history. That's right. Um, but... <laughs> Uh, she also says uh, she, she's, they speculate about how Tenkato was always uh, super um, – he was discreet himself. He would go into like uh, university libraries, like hack into their mainframe so he could um, be online and, and pr post this digital fortress. But then Susan right away says, if he's here in the States and uses something like AOL or CompuServe, I'll snoop his credit card and get a billing address within the hour. So I appreciated the shout out to those two uh, late 90s giants, but – they just talked about how what a genius he was at encryption. Why would he pick a a uh, you know elderly assistant here who only had a CompuServe email address? He worked for the NSA. <laughs> the NSA is not taking their disk of the, of the AOL disk and plugging it in and going. Sounds good, right? Yes. You know, Mike, I've gone I've gone on the lam. Uh, there's federal warrants out for me. I need you to be my my connection uh, back to Lauren if I need to communicate anything. Um, but you know, and you're like, I only have a, uh, a, a flip phone, uh, that's definitely tied to my own address. That'll work. That's fine. I, I'm not taking any precautions. It's one of those, uh, jitterbugs with the huge button. Even better. Yeah. That, that will stand okay. out even more in a crowd. Okay. <laughs> um, um the, the one thing I noted about, so she's super, super, like supernaturally hot, like mm -hmm. hotter than. Like you know, swimsuit models, like yeah. you say, and they keep and, they keep hammering on that throughout this. Uh... And I just thought it would be a funny thing in the movie when she walks by to have the guys kind of lower their sunglasses, <laughs> but then go, "Man, that woman can do a discreet internet search anytime." You know, like, that's that's the gag for that. Yeah, I mean, there's all sorts of uh, uh, you know, I, I'd Google her Bing. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> um. At the end of this chapter, there's a bunch of, as you talked about, her um, uh, Charlie Callis like uh, reactions to Strathmore, mm -hmm. and and the you know, all everyone out there listening right now is going, uh huh, Charlie yeah. Callis. They, yeah, all, yeah. they all they all looked into it. They all uh, you sure. know, have familiarized yeah. themselves with their his oeuvre, of course, and so they know what we're talking about. But at the end of this chapter, Susan gave him a soft smile. <laughs> So I counted just dozens of frowns and tight smiles. Okay. So finally, a soft smile. And if I wish, you know, again, this is not a visual medium, but that would be a good, the equivalent of a sonic challenge to uh, 
Give me a soft smile as compared to your tight smile <laughs> and light frowns. There's lots of variations on frowns, but yeah, uh, well, you know, it was just good to see that she finally softened. Right. Well, as an Estee Lauder model, uh, you, you always think of those as like soft light um, type of thing. So that's uh, maybe that's what she's reverting back to. Well, now, look, now that people have it in their mind, everyone at home, think of Charlie Callis in an Estee Lauder <laughs> ad. There you go. See, it immediately pops into your mind. He's uh, applying mascara as he's uh, you know, imitating a... <laughs> 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 all right. Well, um, that's all I have for Chapter 10. Yeah, yeah me too. Uh, chapter 11 starts with... So it ends with uh, Strathmore revealing that he sent David to Spain. And so Chapter 11, uh, she is not happy about this. Um, Chapter 11, uh, this was the one where I laughed out loud and there would have been spit takes had I been taking in large amounts of liquids. Yes, this uh, Her chap- reaction to <laughs> you, you sent him to Spain. <laughs> it's like, what? What? Right. It, it goes on for two pages. Yeah, it's incredible. And yeah, th- this in the next chapter, I, I sort of stopped and had to recap to Lauren at some point in time because it gets, uh, it gets out of control. But yeah, she's her soft smile is not... Uh, long for this world because now she is flexed like a mother tiger defending her cub. Tiger, you say? Yes, exactly. They're having a moment. <laughs> uh, and they that metaphor, uh, he sticks with it for one sentence before amba- abandoning it entirely. Uh, the tiger lashed out. You've got 20,000 employees at your command. What gives you the right to send my fiance? Um and he has a good explanation for that, actually. Uh, he says, you know, David Becker, no, he's not the only civilian I know. But at six this morning, things were happening quickly. David speaks the language. <laughs> so his uh, his justification why he had to send her fiance, uh, he's among the uh, several billion people who speak the second most spoken language on the planet. <laughs> I had to look it up, but uh, I, it stood out initially. I had no idea it was number two. Did he open his contacts and David was just towards the top? And so yes, he got the call like, hey, could you, uh, yeah. this is the NSA calling. Um, <laughs> could you fly to Spain and get a, get a ring? Right. Okay, great. <laughs> and he didn't, ex- you know, he didn't think David didn't need to explain it to Susan, even though, you know, they, he, he, he got a call from her boss, ex- you know, asking him to do it. It's, it's a very, very peculiar. This is a weird plot point that, Again, the fact that they drill down on it here, that he drills down on it, Dan Brown, makes you wonder, does does he know what he's doing at this point? He obviously doesn't. This is not a plot point. (laughs) Sending a fiancé to Spain so that you can't go on your vacation to Stone Manor is not, that is not like a major thing, like... You know, the the music sting does not come here when you go, what? Right. This is more like a... uh, uh, you know, sitcom thing. Like, wait, we were going to Spain. I know, I sent him to Spain, and this, yeah, I, but I it's just almost, don't understand the, what, who gives a shit. It's almost like a Larry David, uh, you know, like unrelatable um, sort of sitcom thing. Like, you know, the latest season of Curb Your Enthusiasm. There were multiple times where I was like, this is not, uh, this is not the common, uh, the common thing of you know they used to deal with on Seinfeld of like forgetting where you parked your car. This was like. You know, I'm hiring my housekeeper to work on the same day that she hired hers. And now we have a war about like whether the housekeeper can clean both of our mansions on the same. It's like, eh, settle down here. Right. <laughs> uh, but anyway, so that goes on for a few pages of her just continuing to say, you sent my fiance to Spain. <laughs> it, it literally happens like 10 times. But he has a- he goes, what, what was I supposed to do? And he's the director of the NSA. Right, he he has- could just be in a second go like. Shut up! Yeah, what are you get out of my about? office. I'll do whatever I want. No, Your he, relationships don't m- amount to a you know hill of beans to me. I don't get. Yeah, it. in terms of you know they've already established this is a world changing issue they're supposed to deal with, but he passes it off as saying, uh, you know, I I did him a favor, uh, and she and the director says, yeah, I'm paying him ten thousand for one day's work. He'll pick up Tenkado's belongings and he'll fly home. That's a favor. Susan fell silent. She understood it was all about money. So once again, the whole thing hinges on the uh, suspension of disbelief that this Georgetown professor is like, you know, is sort of a, a gig economy guy who's below the poverty line. Oh, that comes up again in a major and bizarre way. <laughs> yeah. We'll get to that. But uh, Strathmore has a wonderful play within a play. Okay. Uh, I'm here's a big what fan he, here- of play within a plays. I mean, it's uh, anytime you can get one of those going. Yeah, and uh, it's done so well here. He uh, He's giving the explanation of why he uh, 
had to do it. And one of his explanations is this. I've had one hell of a morning. I downloaded Tancato's file last night and sat there by the output printer for hours praying trans- translator could break it. <laughs> At dawn, I swallowed my pride and dialed the director. And let me tell you, that was a conversation I was really looking forward to. Sarcasm. <laughs> and here it is. Good morning, sir. I'm sorry to wake you. Why am I calling? I just found out Translator is obsolete. <laughs> it's because of an algorithm my entire top dollar crypto team wouldn't come close, couldn't come close to writing. <laughs> so that was his little play within a play where at, uh, obviously at that point, Susan would have said, sir, yeah. sir, are you, what are you doing? Are you doing the voice of you doing that? Or are you, was he doing what, the little like a uh, finger, uh, pinky and thumb phone, like holding up to his thing and like, switching it to either side to indicate which <laughs> yes. side is. It depends on which, uh, uh, improv school he went to. Yes. You, you're, you're supposed to either hold the phone or you can do the, the uh, pinky and thumb phone. The, the uh, dumbest one. point of contention in, uh, in, in improv. <laughs> yes. Um, yeah, well, so he sort of uh, says that he was not going to call the director. He's also not going to call the president, um, who I guess is, you know, the actual first in line. So this, uh, you know, we've all seen bad thrillers like this before, raises some serious red flags. Right. <laughs> like about the uh, about the thick fleshed man sweating behind the desk and his uh, actual intentions. Because, you know, we, we've, we've seen enough of these that it's like, I didn't want to bother him. It's like, oh, you're keeping this a secret because, you know, somehow, you know, you're the bad guy here. Uh, yeah, that, I mean, there's it's so funny when it comes up later. The uh, I think there's only three characters we can choose from possibly right, sure. to be the person. So I can't wait to guess on that one. But <laughs> well, there is that a naked elderly that, woman uh, trying to use a bedpan in the hospital. Yeah, that's true. Think, that so. could be could be <laughs> could be her. Uh, but yes, I, I'm going to put my money on the. Uh, uh, sweatiest guy. Stroudmore okay. shook his head, a bead of sweat dripping on his <laughs> desk. What a pig. <laughs> and also, Strathmore's wife is revealed to be uh, leaving him, too. So, um, you know, the, the sweating and, and thick flesh just might have been too much for her to handle. Look, he had to sit by a printer for hours. <laughs> Uh, you know, that, that a guy works up a sweat when he sits by a printer. <laughs> yeah. You never know when it could be uh, requiring new toner. Like that's just a, you know, well, you might have to a uh, PC load letter it. I don't second office space. Uh, <laughs> yes. uh, but so the, the allusion to, uh, David's finances, like gets another, I sort of put these out of order, but I think this, it comes back in this chapter, but it's revealed that, um, his finances had sort of like changed their relationship a bit. I'll just read the whole, uh. The whole description here. The president of Georgetown had offered David a promotion to the language department chair. The president had warned him that his teaching hours would be cut back and there would be an increased paperwork, but there was also a substantial raise in salary. Susan had wanted to cry out, (laughs) David, don't do it. You'll be miserable. We have plenty of money. Who cares which one of us earns it? But it was not her place. In the end, she stood by his decision to accept. As they fell asleep that night, Susan tried to be happy for him, but something inside kept telling her it would be a disaster. She'd been right, but she'd never been counted on being so right. So it, again, is sort of like this. He's he's making, you know, reckless decisions because of his desperate need for money and his reluctance to let her, you know, uh, amazing government salary paid for with Vichy Swan prime rib. Uh, you know, she, he's not willing to let her do the work because of, I guess, old school attitudes or something. I don't know. And now you said that she thought of that as they were lying in bed together. <laughs> yes. Was that after she had had animal sex with him? <laughs> Clearly. Right. Yes. She was the, uh, he was the first animal that he'd ever, uh, had ever banged. Yeah. Ugh. <laughs> um, all right. Well, that's all I have for, that's chapter 11. There's so many chapters. So oh, let, let me just read this last thing to you. I, I just thought this was a good, uh, um, timing, timing okay. sort of thing. It's, uh, this is, uh, Strathmore, she's not picking up on any weird vibes about him refusing to call the president or the director, but, uh, she still, uh, is admiring, uh, Strathmore in that instant, Susan realized what she respected so much about Trevor Strathmore for 10 years through thick and thin. He had always led the way for her steadfast, unwavering. It was his dedication that amazed her, his unshakable allegiance to his principles, his country, and his ideals. Come what may, Commander Trevor Strathmore was a guiding light in a world of impossible decisions. So she, so she realized that in an instant. 
She that was <laughs> she. That's a hell of an instinct. Yes, she's picturing his unshakable allegiance to his principles, country, and ideals, and realized that he was a guiding light in a world of impossible decisions. So yeah, look at I'll, that sweaty guiding light, <laughs> the jowly sweaty, his hair standing up like <laughs> pointing mean, in every direction. Oh, he's he's a he's my lighthouse. Yeah, so he's my lodestar. It's a good uh, a, a good instant for her to realize. Maybe it's just that 170 IQ working its magic. Um, That's true. That's but, true. Yeah. They don't think the way that we do. <laughs> um, uh, chapter 12. Chapter 12. Well, well, well. <laughs> um, what did the very opening of this chapter put you in mind of? Something uh, very specific to one of our previous books. Oh. Uh, so I'll, I'll read it. I'll read it and let the yeah. fans... Um, this, uh, this body had been stripped naked and dumped unceremoniously on an aluminum table oh. or aluminium for our UK fans. The eyes had not yet found their vacant, lifeless gaze. I'm thinking, uh, I mean, I, my, my heart is beating heavy already, but, uh, Beth Kitteridge. Chapter three, Tech Wars. Yeah. <laughs> Oh. Aluminum table, stripped <laughs> naked, dumped unceremoniously. <laughs> wow. Didn't he uh, d- uh, defecate yeah, and... Yeah, mess, uh, mess. You've made a mess. <laughs> and urinate <laughs> as the robot hand uh, yeah, probed him, him or whatever. Mm-hmm. Wow. Yeah, so that was so uh, that was the hero of that book, Jake Cardigan. Yes. <laughs> but I think, I think later Beth Kitteridge, or at least the android simulacrum of the hottest woman in the book, was also like naked on she the table. She was on an alum- aluminum table as well? Yeah. Okay. Uh, I like that it said he'd been to funerals, and but there was something particularly unnerving about that one. I, I mean, every funeral I've ever been to has had a body stripped naked and dumped in ceremoniously on a sure. table. Is that not of what course. they're supposed to be like? That's, huh. <laughs> uh, Grandpa, I, have... I mean, put it in his will. That's what he wanted. I, yeah. Our, Arlington our Cemetery was uses... very confused. It was... Our our family uses Hank's discount funerals, and uh, <laughs> that's what you get from it. We prefer it that way. <laughs> There's no no reason to waste money. Uh, the yellow tooth uh, captain is it? Uh, yes. Uh, yeah, he he's a a great character. Oh, sorry, lieutenant, lieutenant, the the yellow tooth lieutenant. Yes, it makes a big difference, I'm sure. Um, man, I had this as a dumb sentence, but people are going to have this. The lieutenant looked offended in the way. Only a Spaniard can be offended. People did submit that. Multiple I, people. I, sorry to burn that one, but I think it's worth a, a discussion. Is yeah. I mean, obviously, we're we're finally getting into Dan Brown's sense of humor here, mm-hmm. and stuff comes up uh, a little bit later in yep. here too, as well. Yeah, uh, and it's not good. No, he should have kept that close. He oh should boy, have, he should have just done the. Uh, the the straight ahead. Uh, I'm being serious here. He never should have unveiled his attempts to do kind of die hard, you know, humor in dire situations. Sure. <laughs> uh, he, he should have just stopped right there, and uh, the, I think that's his first salvo in this uh, process, and it doesn't go well. I guess so. Yeah, I mean, it's a it, he throws a lot of things at you about about Spain and Seville and stuff like that. But I, 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 I too bad we can't do a a uh, physical challenge with that. I do have a friend from Barcelona though, so maybe I'll ask him to uh, send me some facial reactions of of what he interprets that as. Uh, there was a for those of you who like um, uh, faulty towers, and again, reaching to a very very current thing. Everybody's watching <laughs> faulty towers during these times. There was a, a lot of humor directed at the fact that uh, his assistant, who he hired on the cheap, was from Barcelona, huh. and that was just supposed to be <laughs> a joke as he would screw everything up, and then uh, Faulty would just say, I'm so sorry, he's from Barcelona, and <laughs>, laughs. So, like, wow. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Well, There's I a couple mean, things where, like, in this book where I just was like, his experience with Spain or his perception must be just wildly different than what mine... Uh, well, mine has because you know I went there and as we discussed at our live show, sophomore year after sophomore year of high school, and you know everything about it was a uh, you know ideal tourist destination, like you know romantic city. But uh, it's uh, we, we we learned some more things about it that that fly in the face of those assumptions. Indeed, indeed, okay. I did uh, like- especially when he tries to point him to the uh, tourist locations. Yes, and, yes, and then we get the. Uh, uh, well, I'll I'll just read it. So yep. this is Dan Dan Brown's sense of humor. Uh, this is the lieutenant, the yellow tooth lieutenant talking to uh, uh, the charge, David Becker here. 
We don't, of course, have his entire body, the lieutenant added. Solo el escroto. Becker stopped packing and stared at the lieutenant. Solo el escroto? He fought off a grin. <laughs> Just his scrotum? The officer nodded proudly. Yes. When the church obtains the remains of a great man, they saint him and spread the relics to different cathedrals so everyone can enjoy their splendor. And you got the... Becker stifled a laugh. <laughs> Oi, it's a pretty important part, the officer defended. It's not like we got a rib or a knuckle like those churches in Galicia. You should really stay and see it. So there's Dan Brown's humor, everyone. Yeah, so that is about Christopher Columbus. That was yes. you know, so he's uh, he's directing him to that. And I imagine the body is just there, like, you know, like wheezing as it expels gases, like as its type of thing. Like the, the, the naked dead guy is just, there, as they're having this little, uh, you know, uh, late 90s comedy bit in front of him. Yes, his uh, colon is bloating, of course, <laughs> with the, the gases. His rigor mortis is... Uh, rigor mortis goes away after a while, right? So his body started kind of moving yeah, flopping, slightly as yeah. it flops down. Weekend at Bernie's. But right. so this is all predicated on, um, you know, Christopher Columbus. Multiple people wrote in to say, uh, of course, this is not true. Um, Columbus's body is in two different places, I think. Uh, one of them is Spain, but obviously it's not a scrotum. And it's not, he was never sainted by the Catholic Church. So it's... Um, it's just f false, you know. It's Wait, not even none of this kept is in true. Computer. No, I uh, just we have uh, a, something this dumb. I just assumed I, I didn't even I, bother looking it up. Boggles the mind. Boggles the mind. I have a. I have a. Someone wrote in right here. I, let me call up the email. But uh, um, oh yeah, George just said the business about Columbus his body is complete BS. Five minutes of research reveals that while two locations claim to have his remains. There's zero nonsense about him being sliced up and distributed all over Spain, and he's not considered a saint by the Catholic Church. Uh, one more item for the list of stuff Jan Brown made up about Catholicism. He was also Italian, too, right? Ah, <laughs> uh, yes. <laughs> um, so, yeah, very puzzling. Bizarre. I mean... Um... But so th th that was for all this for this joke. He does that. <laughs> right, yeah. The, yeah. The payoff was worth it to, to completely fabricate stuff and and uh, ruin the flow of your thriller. But that was all the reason they're talking about it is because uh, um, he says, poor bastard, heart attack, huh? Uh, that's what the, and the lieutenant says. That's what they told me. The lieutenant sighed and shook his head sympathetically. The Seville son can be cruel. Be careful out there tomorrow. <laughs> So again, this uh, he's 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 warning him about you know venturing out into a uh, area where people are just melting in the street, I guess. But then uh, Becker responds, "Thanks, but I'm heading home." The officer looked shocked. "You just got here, I know, but the guy is paying my airfare, is waiting for these items." The lieutenant looked offended. "You mean you're not going to experience Seville?" So he's sort of just giving him a uh, like a eat, pray, love pitch here, as he's uh, you know clearly is is investigating you know a potential murder <laughs> yeah when when an official comes into your life and you ask him so uh wh what are you in town for i'm in town for this oh and when are you going back when i'm done with this right you, you wouldn't go what <laughs> yes yeah <laughs> what do you mean that yeah. can't be yeah like, people are yeah. I, mean, I could be grieving i could be representing people who are grieving like what on earth are you talking about and then you know <laughs> from that directly into uh uh Columbus's sack. <laughs> right. Well, the uh, the body of the what what is he described as? Because this was in fanfic before. Uh, yellow. Yes. There's a weird description of his flesh at some point. Yeah, it's uh, yellow except for these the pinkish sun sunburn from the from the cruel Seville sun. Yeah. His <laughs> twisted fingers. And... Yes, he has three fingers. They're all twisted, and that's where that was the uh, the the final dramatic thing of this chapter was that he notices there was a uh, ring tan on one of his remaining fingers. Uh, a lot hinges on that ring tan. Yeah. So uh, you know, and keep in mind, this is not a uh, this is not Sherlock Holmes coming over here. This is the uh, Georgetown language professor who's all of a sudden you know noticing details like that that. Uh, I'm guessing your average linguistics guy might not be keyed into. Right. And the head of the NSA said, go over there and grab Get his... Get a folder. <laughs> yeah, grab his, his uh, shoebox full yeah. of his crap that they... the Obviously, the yellow-toothed Spanish lieutenant just dumped his crap in a shoebox. Just grab that shoebox and then hop back on the private plane 
with your ten thousand dollars. Yeah, he didn't even say you know inspect the uh, the naked guy. You know, it was right. just about retrieving the effects. Uh, so <sighs> that's all I have for twelve. So then we're on to chapter thirteen. No, oh, that's chapter thirteen. No, I don't. Uh, chapter thirteen is a good one though. It introduces us to a new character. Who uh, is, Nakatomi uh, Plaza or whatever his yeah, name is. Tokugen uh, Numataka, who's okay. the head of Numatech, which uh, I <laughs> mentioned to you and you didn't seem to have uh, have have had the immediate association, probably because it's ancient as well, of the uh, the Numa Numa guy. I thought of that, yes. Now <laughs> now that uh, we're here, immediately I went, ah, there we go, yes. <laughs> so Numa Numa Tech is what I will choose to refer to it as throughout the rest of the book. Um, that, do you remember, remember that guy's name? That's a good trivia question. The, real, the real name of the Numa Numa guy? I know it off the top of my head. There was probably one week in my life when I could have recalled that, but that week is many, many years ago. So what what was his name? Gary Brolsma. <laughs> <laughs> that uh, did not ring a bell, so maybe I made a false statement there. Sure. Maybe there was never a week where I knew his name. A, well, a life well lived. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Uh, that's another thing to look up. I it, probably, if you click on Charlie Callis, it'll probably mm. come up in the link. Yeah. Related uh, searches. Related searches. Yes. Men with dignity. <laughs> 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 but, uh, so, uh, Numa, Togagin Numataka is about to close the biggest deal of his life and his body is alive with the cool rush of adrenaline. I don't really think of an adrenaline rush as being a, a cooling sensation, but, uh, uh that, that uh, phrase comes up a number of times. <laughs> cool rush or a cool uh, rush. The, of ad- the uh, rush of adrenaline. Nice. He felt it. Yeah. <laughs> so it might be cool. I don't know. We'll see when it comes up. And so this, uh, this whole exchange uh, reminded me of something. Uh, he, he gets a phone call from someone, an American who is essentially claiming that they are the partner and they have the copy of the digital fortress passkey and they want to sell it to him. Um, but Numataka, for whatever reason, uh, immediately just thinks that he's being punked. He's just like, you know, I, I don't believe that this guy is, is telling the truth for some reason. So he pretty much does the entire shtick of uh, Principal Rooney when, uh, when, when Cameron calls him up, uh, sure. pretending to be uh, George Peterson. Yeah. And, well, uh, this is George Peterson. <laughs> and yes. Mr. Rooney uh, immediately is like, it's Ferris Bueller. And so he like tells him to go to hell and smooch his butt or something. But uh, th- this is pretty much th- – this guy does the exact same thing. He uh, he goes, my name is North Dakota. Numataka stifled a laugh. <laughs> <laughs> it's as though he's talking – to a uh, yellow-toothed Spanish lieutenant. He has to stifle a laugh. <laughs> and then he's he's smoking something called a umami cigar, a uh, you know savory cigar, I guess. Yeah, He took I'm, a long... I'm a pull- part owner of a cigar shop. I've never heard of an <laughs> yes. umami cigar. And this was, you know, I think everyone learned about umami maybe 15 years ago, so this would have been even more mysterious in 1998. Um but uh, he took a long pull of his umami cigar and played along with the caller's pathetic charade. <laughs> <laughs> no, honestly, I've got the other key. <laughs> uh, and then uh, he covers the receiver and laughs aloud. And he, <laughs> <laughs> I, I put he really does get in the, the mind of a Japanese business tycoon, doesn't he? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Because then later he says uh, to himself, this is uh, uh, Numa Numa to himself, says, no shit, thought Numa Numa. It's <laughs> worth 10 times that. But man, he has nailed the Japanese businessman. Yes, really. Especially because he does try to, uh, he does try to, uh, insert some of that earlier where he's, he's, you know, taken what you know about Japanese businessmen if you've seen an 80s movie, uh, sort of like the Ernest Klein impression that we had from Ready Player One where the, uh, those two guys, Cho and the other guy were like always like, right. you know, yep. he, he has behaved without honor. Um, but he says, it has been a wide move on Tankado's part to have a partner. Even in Japan, business practices had become dishonorable. Um, so you, you get that sort of stereotypical. Oh, uh, yeah. You get, uh, uh, what's the movie? Sean Connery, Rising Sun, oh, 1985 yes. <laughs> or whatever. You know? Right. Yes. Yeah. yeah. But it's it's that sort of, you know, I think we, we joked that every time those characters spoke in Ready Player One, Ernest Klein was envisioning a gong sounding in the background. And that's sort of what you have <laughs> with <laughs> this. <laughs> yeah. So it's ridiculous. But um, so he thinks that someone is trying to suss out what his bid was. So that they can top it, I guess. So after he laughs aloud, he says, he couldn't help asking, how much are you asking for both keys? $20 million. $20 million was ex- almost exactly what Numataka had bid. $20 million, he gasped in mock horror. That's outrageous. 
<laughs> so I, I, I don't know. The whole thing had me delighted. Like if this is some sort of tycoon, you know, a, uh, you know, a, uh, ruthless, like Rupert Murdoch type or something, it's hilarious to him, you know, imagine him doing this routine and not being like, sure, you know, I'll put this guy on it. You know, you take the call, you know, second in command, like break this guy down and, and get the thing no matter what. Right. <laughs> Uh, yeah, but the chapter ends with, uh, I'll be in touch, the voice said. The line went dead. Which, <laughs> as we all know, do do lines go? I, maybe they went dead in Japan back at that time. Right. I don't know. Yes. <laughs> See, he hung up the phone. As, yeah, as he, they do in, um, in movies where uh, for years the other person would hang up and then the dial tone would start again, which huh. wasn't a thing. Huh. So, you know, it's just that thing of well, why do that? A Everybody signifier? knows that that yeah. doesn't happen. That's not how it works. <laughs> but I, uh, so the, the going, you know, Numa Taka had offered $20 million for the, um, this key that we've been told will, you know, upend the way that the entire world works. It will be included on every computer. Um, so, <laughs> and he had the, he had the same idea, right? Uh, Numa Numa did to um, put it he's in chips. Put it on a a a chip that can't be a tamper proof chip. <laughs> yes, yes. So well, everybody shut thinks and... that immediately about this thing. I, yeah. I just think that that's funny that nobody else has any other application for what it is. It's just yeah, you put it on one of them tamper proof chips and you right. chuck it in a bunch of stuff and uh, you know profit. So so just as in terms of that, this is this is uh, you know a re- revelatory thing for for every businessman in the world. Uh, how much how much money do you think Michael Jordan earned in uh, 1998, the year this book was written? His salary from the Chicago Bulls. Oh, just the salary? Yeah. Oh, uh, twelve million. Thirty three million dollars. Okay. <laughs> so you know you have uh, Michael Jordan jumping into this negotiations, being like, "Well, that seems wildly underpriced." Like, sure, I'll <laughs> yeah. I'll invest in that. Like, hey, like Scotty, you want to kick in two million dollars to outbid this uh, Japanese business tycoon? Like, right. we've, we've talked about it before with like movies that go into the future. It's like add an extra thousand to the year that it's going to be right. uh, just to cover your bases here. Like add an extra zero to the price of this chip because 200 million, that starts to be uh, unaffordable for, you know, your basic celebrities. Right. <laughs> um, uh, that's all I had for 13. Yeah, me too. Uh, uh, chapter 14, we go back to Becker and the, uh, the Asian's face radiating a pinkish glow. Yeah, uh, the rest of them a pale yellow. So this was the the I'm the, sorry, this the was fanfic the, of the dead Asian. The fanfic, yes. yeah, uh, yeah. We read it but last we're just time. Back in this same spot, so arbitrarily jumping between two points for for no reason. Yes, and they the chapters come fast and furious, very very quick ones here. So the you know we're not leaving stuff out. It just is you know they're a, a page or two long in the book. Mm-hmm. But and this he, one is a page. Yes, <laughs> but he uh, so this is he he does his Sherlock Holmes routine. He points to the strip of pale flesh. See how this isn't sunburned here. Uh, looks like he was wearing a ring. So I guess that's why he set up the sun as being this all powerful, crushing you know weather phenomenon, so that he would you would understand how a guy could sunburn so quickly. I I guess I mean I get I get a watch tan when I go out and play tennis for an hour, right? Sure, Isn't yes. I mean, it's under the a, cruel Minnesota sun. <laughs> cruel. Yes. <laughs> so I, I guess that must be the reason. But mm-hmm. uh, this this is also like meeting out this information pretty poorly. Like we had that whole chapter of him talking about scrotes and everything, mm-hmm. and now he's just noticing a ring tan. That just seems like that. That could have been done in the past chapter. He didn't need to right. spend another chapter on this, did you? Yeah. I mean, he must have a method to his decision to do this like this in terms of just, uh, you know, you'll keep reading if the next chapter is only a couple pages type of thing, like it's a thriller technique or something. Uh, I, mean, I mean, yeah, I've seen it done well. I'm just <laughs> saying this is just very poorly made it out here. Sure. Uh, but we do, uh, he's got this thing now and he's on it. He was on the Umami Cigars. And the Ducato cigarettes. Oh, wow. So this is just a, this is his way of- A little local flavor. Yeah, giving some authenticity. <laughs> but yeah, umami cigar. Is he dipped in soy sauce? Like, or uh, is it dipped in Marmite? Like, that's the thing that, that Kenji's I, I always it it's, adding it's to- just, It's a, uh, it is a, a brand. A brand? It's, oh. a, um, it's a label of a brand. So it's not a brand itself. It's one of their cigars. Hmm. But I, I don't know. It must be old and maybe they- heard it first or something and just took it i don't know he must have ran one hell of a discreet internet search to find that information out back in 1998 <laughs> he sat by his printer for hours waiting for it to come back up 
Um, but yeah, so he's he's saying like there's a ring tan, and then the lieutenant, the officer, is suddenly perplexed. He studied the corpse's finger, then he flushed sheepishly. My God, he chuckled. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't notice that at first, but my God, he chuckled. <laughs> the story was true. Um, and then, so we, we get this information. The guy who phoned in the emergency was some kind of Canadian tourist, kept talking about a ring, babbling in the worst damn Spanish I ever heard. Um, so the police, you know, took this information and we've seen this happen in movies all the time. It happened in the last thing we did. There's some sort of alarm system. There's some sort of warning. It goes off and the person, you know, monitoring says, eh, it's probably just an error. And it's like, why do you have this system if the one time it actually goes off, you immediately dismiss it out of hand? And <laughs> they've done that, that here. The, what, what's the Spider-Man that we did where uh, <laughs> the, the guy was in the pit, right? Where they're going to send the big... Iron like, Man, I think, yeah. Maybe, or I don't know. No, Spider-Man with the, the guy oh, the Sandman? Sand. Yeah, 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 yeah. God, oh, that's how he, yeah. That's how he... And they're like, yeah, it must have been a, a bird got in there. Like, <laughs> then why do we have the system? I mean, <laughs> yes. It's going off. <laughs> yes, so you're immediately a false positive. Yeah. <laughs> um yeah that was immediately what i thought of but uh so yeah he they got uh, eyewitness information from a you know, the one guy who reported it in and we're like idiot <laughs> he's babbling <laughs> but this comes up again also what i don't understand like that a canadian tourist says the guy handed him a ring and everyone goes what that mm-hmm. is the, the strangest story I've ever heard. <laughs> there is no reason for skepticism about right. a guy dying and handing you a ring. Like, what do you, uh, well, yeah. Right. I mean, it's slightly, un, you don't expect that to happen every day, but mm-hmm. it's not a thing when someone tells you that, that you go, but what? <laughs> He's obviously been burnt by the uh, Seville sun. There's right. no way. Yes. Yeah, it's a, uh, it, again, if our, if our genius cannot decipher the most obvious anagram in the world, it's your, your, your uh, average intelligence people are probably not going to be uh, making the good decisions either. Yeah. Um, but that's a short chapter, so I don't, I don't have Yeah, he says, where's the there? ring now? And the officer takes a puff and says, long story, which you know, doesn't really turn out to be that long. It's story. not a long story at all. <laughs> I was wondering where this is going, like this <laughs> babbling guy speaking in bad Spanish. And then it turns out to be just the most normal thing in the world. Yes. Um, but it, kick, it kicks us into chapter 15, uh, back at the NSA headquarters. And uh, I don't know what your first note is, but mine, uh, mine gets back to... Uh, Mine gets back to a little something for daddy. Oh yeah, what is it? I didn't, I didn't, I didn't tell you about that. <laughs> so this is the. Uh, I don't. I don't know if they publish. They mostly publish pictures. But if if WikiFeet has a as a text section, I think this is probably going to be one of the most uh, most read sections on it. Oh, now I know what you're going. To. <laughs> yes. Susan slipped out of her Salvatore Ferragamo flats and dug her stockinged toes into the thick pile carpet. <laughs> well-paid government employees were encouraged to refrain from lavish displays of personal wealth. It was usually no problem for Susan, but she was perfectly happy with her modest duplex Volvo sedan and conservative wardrobe. But shoes were another matter. Even when Susan was in college, she's budgeted for the best. So she's slipping off her, you know, expensive heels and, uh, oh no, flats, I'm sorry. And, uh, and just rifling her stockinged feet through the uh, through the carpet, and I guess the internet has warped me because that was the first thing I thought of was <laughs> how the uh, foot fetishes would respond to that sort of thing. Yeah, but it is all justified by that very common saying that her aunt used to tell her: <laughs> "You can't jump for the stars if your feet hurt." Her aunt had once told her, yes. which I assume when she said that, she's like. All right, look, Aunt. You one time you get, yeah. and if you ever repeat that, yeah, to her aunt sloshing her martini. You know, <laughs> go to bed, please. You're... <laughs> and when uh, you get where you're going, you you darn better look good. So her aunt, you know, and we know from the beginning that you know she was not a uh, she was a late bloomer in terms of looks. So her her aunt was probably this was some severe criticism. Her aunt was a uh, was shallow as hell. <laughs> when you're as plain as you, you gotta have shoes that look good <laughs> you ugly little tramp <laughs> um, my my first note was um they they uh designed the place that she's at to look uh to feel like home yeah so this this exact code breakers describes, cave exactly describes my home plush carpets high-tech sound system fully stocked fridge kitchenette nerf basketball hoop <laughs> So yes, <laughs> all the comforts of home. That Instead is, of a kitchen, I have a kitchenette. 
<laughs> my fridge is always fully stocked and a high tech sound system, whatever that is. To be fair, if you're uh, if you're if you're gutting all the vicious swa you can eat, you don't really need a, a super high tech kitchen because you can go and and get you know uh, all the comforts of home just down the hall. That's true. That's true. It's like one of those uh, Silicon Valley places where the uh, you know the play areas are are so lavish, right? Always stocked with kind bars and whatever <laughs> kombucha on tap, eat. yeah, ping yeah. pong table, mm-hmm. yep. But uh, yeah, I don't know when uh, when it became the signifier for like the fun office, but the 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 Nerf hoop or the uh, the yeah. hoop above the trash can that would be an interesting sort of uh, research of that trope because I'm sure that that origi- originated somewhere and uh, it it definitely caught on for a while. It's it sticks to me that that it's a uh, um, advertising agency trope. Oh, like we're, yeah. we're creative. We have a Nerf hoop. Right. You're, or there's pencils stuck in the ceiling. Huh? <laughs> yeah. Uh, we're pretty nutty. If you want to keep up with this crew, you better get used to this kind of <laughs> shenanigans. Right. But it's one of those things that's also like, you know, please don't do that while we're discussing, uh, you know, how to intercept the uh, the the cables that are that are talking about incoming 9-11. Like we, we, we do right. not use actually use that hoop type of thing. Like the <laughs> like the rock band we used to have in the uh, in the early Rift Tracks office where we'd be like, well this is a fun place. Let's go play it on our lunch break. And people would li- lean in and be like, you know, you knew that they were like saying can you not, but they weren't uh, they weren't aggressive enough to ask you not to do it. Right. Yeah, a guy's just dunking him and he's talking about some uh, dictator, you know, like he's <laughs> yes. just doing one after the other. Like, yeah, I guess he uh did a bunch of uh, sarin gas on his own people. Bizarre, yeah. huh? Yeah. Swish. Yeah. yeah. Ooh, yeah. <laughs> Michael Jordan earning $33 million <laughs> a year. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, they, uh, then they, they get more of the, uh, the, the funny thing about the electronic frontier frontation foundation being the villain, um, six months ago, this is uh, just, this is great. When the EFF broke a story that an NSA submarine was snooping underwater telephone cables, Strathmore calmly leaked a conflicting story that the submarine was actually bur- illegally burying toxic waste. The EFF and the Oceanic Environmentalists spent so much time bickering over which version was true, the media eventually tired of the story and moved on. <laughs> so to make themselves appear like more of a good guy, they just said they were illegally burying toxic waste, which is a uh, – it's uh, Terry Silver in Karate Kid 3 was uh, right. had that, you know, 10 years ago, nuclear was the preferred waste. You could bury it everywhere, but now everyone's a detective, including that damn Electronic Frontiers Foundation, you know. <laughs> The uh, ASPCA is breathing down my neck about all those puppies I'm kicking. Yeah. But also that he calmly leaked it. <laughs> like what? I mean, it's just a disinformation campaign. I, I, that seems to be his go-to thing anyway. So right. he's not going to get too worked up about it, is he? Like, Yeah. Oh, it's a- <laughs> I'm, I'm an a-hole. I'm, I'll do whatever it takes. <laughs> yeah. I'll, I'll ruin the uh, original reporter's life by uh, conflicting the information. Yeah. Uh, but so this whole chapter, what this is about, oh, by the way, uh, she chuckled that Strathmore had encountered difficulty sending the tracer himself. <laughs> so her job here, because she walks in and she sends the, she she fills in some data fields mm-hmm. that he did wrong. And then she just sends it and waits. Folks so at home, her, I'm so, so sorry I didn't capture the actual data filling scene to, uh, I didn't, yeah. I didn't. Her, so her job is when dad messes up sending an email, she sends an email. That's her job at the NSA. <laughs> yep. No. Like, dad, I told you a hundred times you have to put this in this field. Yeah. Like, you can't well, just type their just... name. You have to put the, you know, uh, can shift to, and that puts the at symbol. Yeah. Susan finished configuring her tracer and queued it for release. Then she hit return. The computer <laughs> beeped once. Tracer sent. Now came the waiting game. <laughs> wow. Oh, I, I somehow <laughs> so just like dumb. glossed over that. Man, it is. That's, uh, her, that's her job at the NSA. Yeah. And then, you know, that's that's the accurate depiction of that. So we, we make fun of, you know, there's a great hacking scene in uh, Swordfish where Hugh Jackman's oh, God, like, yeah. you know, <laughs> tapping like eight different keyboards and smoking cigarettes and like, you know, being like, go, 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 go. But, you know, so you you can have it either way. You can have that and it's laughable. Or you can have the actual way it works and it's probably right. even more laughable. Now comes the waiting game. <laughs> but then uh, you get one more um, info dump that as far as the other ones go, I'll give him credit. He he gets the ideas across, you know, dumb as they are. And then, you you, you know, about Biggleman's say for the Schrodinger's cat or whatever. 
uh, you gain an understanding of the concept. This one about the brainstorm software. Oh, brainstorm, yes. That Strathmore uses to make decisions complete, completely out of place. It just is, they must have realized that they needed it later in the book and just found a place to wedge it in here. Uh, he uh, he worked religiously with Brainstorm. <laughs> and then you get this. This is a great. But as a TFM device, timeline, flowchart, and mapping, mapping software. Go on. <laughs> yes. It was a powerful tool for outlining complex strategies and predicting weaknesses. <laughs> so this is some sort of just AI thing or, you know, like, or modeling, actually. Yeah, it's just, yeah, simulations of possible outcomes or something. So, yeah. Um. It better come up later because it was a whole page about it right now that didn't connect to anything. It wasn't, you know, him about to use the software or her. It was just sort of like, this exists. Oh, oh this is Chekhov's brainstorm for sure. Yes, more on this later. On <laughs> uh, well, that's the last note I have on that. We can, uh, we've got, I think. It... Well, I'll give you the chapter and uh, okay. the, the door hissed open. The node three doors. David just called. There's been a setback. <laughs> And I wish he had gone on like something about a yellow toothed lieutenant who wanted him to see a scrotum <laughs> and, a, and a, a, a ring tan. Like, what are you, Stradmore? You, yeah. you okay, yeah. buddy? <laughs> He's about to collapse himself. Have you been out in the sun? <laughs> this DC sun. I mean, it gets like 95 degrees here in August. Uh, I mean, it's, it's like Seville, Seville almost. But, yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, well, so yeah, we can move on to chapter 16, but I think uh, I'm cruising on my. Modest success from last week. Very, yep. very modest. Arrogance One. high, perhaps letting your guard down. I don't hmm. know. Does you... something come before a fall? I can't remember <laughs> what that is. <laughs> Not as far as I know, but I only read uh, Greek myths, so I don't think that ever happens in those. So right. Here's uh, the fanfic. This could be uh, future excerpts of Digital Fortress, or they could be fanfic submitted by our... Uh, talented listeners. So you have to choose which are which, and they could all be one. They could all be the other. They could be a combination of both. We're going to do five this time. Here's number one. All right. Becker tried to protest, but another sharp knock on the head silenced him. His legs folded and strong, sweaty arms carried him towards the waiting car. The ring. Where was the ring? Was it still in his pocket? Do they even know I have it? He caught a glimpse of yellow teeth smiling at him. The lieutenant from the morgue. Lo siento, senor. My apologies. But it seems you won't be getting that tour of the city after all. Mm. I like the, the sweaty is good. <laughs> uh, and I mean, it's obviously it's... It's in Seville, so I mean... It's hot. I mean, yeah. yes. It's yeah. killing people Skin constantly. is boiling, yeah. Second degree uh, burns by... Um, hmm. Hmm. Understated. I'm going to say that that is fanfic. Okay. Here's number two. As David put the rim of his gl- as David put the rim of the glass to his lips, a ginger bouquet hit his nostrils. He stopped and put it back down. A strawberry citrus and ginger smoothie, usually only called for a dash of ginger, not enough to be <laughs> detectable by smell. It was subtle, but ever since David had been served the nutritious drink at the Velderhof Country Club during one of his lecture tours in North Rhine, Westphalia, it had become a favorite for settling the stomach and aiding digestion. Something must have been done to it. He looked De La Rosa squarely in the eyes. Would you like to try some of this, David asked. It really is delicious, like a creamy liquid ginger cake. The Spaniard's right eye twitched. No, thank you, senor. Ginger makes me break out into hives. <laughs> well, that is fanfic, but I, I, give it, I give it a golf clap. That's good. <laughs> right. Drilling down on the weird food obsessions. Uh, yeah. yeah. Perfect. All right. Confidence. Very Number three. Confidence. Number three. Geez, Brinkerhoff choked. You think we have a virus? Midge sighed. Nothing else it could be. Could be none of your damn business, the deep voice boomed from behind them. Midge knocked her head against the window. Brinkerhoff tipped over the director's chair and wheeled toward the door. Toward the voice, he immediately knew the silhouette. Director, Brinkerhoff gasped. He strode over and extended his hand. Welcome home, sir. The huge man ignored it. I... I thought, Brinkerhoff stammered, retracting his hand, I thought you were in South America. Leland Fontaine glared down at his aide with eyes like bullets. Yes, and now I'm back. Oh, well. <laughs> I like that Leland one. Leland Fontaine. I like that one as well. Uh, who, who, what was the guy at the beginning? What's the 
Brinkerhoff and Brinkerhoff, Midge. Brinkerhoff, yeah. Yes. He's no Chartruckian. <laughs> um, and neither is Midge. But uh, what are we, are we in a Hitchcock movie from uh, 53 here? Yeah. Midge? That's, uh, that's, that's, uh, that's fanfic. Okay. Let's see. Here's number four. Jabba rem- resembled a giant tadpole. <laughs> like the cinematic creature for whom he was nicknamed, the man was a hairless spheroid. As resident guardian angel of all NSA computer systems, Jabba marched from department to department, tweaking, soldering, and reaffirming his credo that prevention was the best medicine. No NSA computer had ever been infected under Jabba's reign. He intended to keep it that way. At the moment, however, Jabba was taking a break and enjoying pepperoni calzones in the NSA's all-night commissary. (laughs) That's not (laughs) what they eat there. (laughs) He was about to dig into his third when when his cellular phone rang. Go, he said, coughing as he swallowed a mouthful. Jabba, a woman's voice cooed. It's Midge. Data Queen, the huge man gushed. He'd, uh, sorry, Data Queen, the huge man gushed. He's always had a soft spot for Midge Milken. She was sharp, and she was the only woman Jabba had ever met who flirted with him. How the hell are you? No complaints. Jabba wiped his mouth. You on site? Yep. Care to join me for a calzone? Love to, Jabba, but I'm watching these hits. Really, he snickered. Mind if I join you? Wait. There, there's Midge in that one and the one before? Yes. What? <laughs> this is unprecedented in real or fanfic history. People <laughs> well, are either reading ahead. What? I don't understand. It's. I mean, yeah, sometimes people have read ahead and sort of like... A, we had one last time that referenced North Dakota, but I left it out because I didn't understand what it meant, so... Well, this is, uh, I, I don't know. I, I smell a rat. I'm, <laughs> I'm calling foul here, but I mean, that's, that's fanfic. But people okay. looking ahead to trick me on things that aren't even, that we haven't even read yet? Come on. Um, I'm, ca- I'm calling this all fanfic. Go to hell, everyone. It's wow. All fanfic. Wow. Um, go, so yeah, that's a quote. Mike Nelson, jackals. go to hell, everyone. <laughs> Uh, and here's our final one. The man went from white to purple. You know Dewdrop? He wiped the sweat from his fleshy forehead and drenched his terry cloth sleeve. <laughs> More sweating. He was about to speak when the bathroom door swung open. Both men looked up. Rocio Eva Granada stood in the doorway. A vision. Long flowing red hair, perfect Iberian skin, deep brown eyes, a high smooth forehead. She wore a white terry cloth robe that matched the Germans. The tie was drawn snugly over her wide hips, and the neck fell loosely open to reveal her tanned cleavage. She stepped into the bedroom, the picture of confidence. May I help you? she asked in throaty English. That's it? Yep. Ah, oh, see. Uh, I don't know. Protest, man. The Midge, the, the Midge thing threw me off. I'm, I'm, you can I'm, you can reevaluate anything at any given time. I mean, I there's think you've a, a done that bead before. of a bead of sweat falling from my <laughs> jowly face right now. Well, wipe it uh, off and soak your uh, soak your sleeve. Uh, look, one of the rules is it could all be fanfic, right? Yeah, it could all be fanfic, all be real, right? All right, then it's all fanfic. You wow. like that? Huh? Huh, wow. everyone? You like that? <laughs> you're taking the, uh, the uh, me saying that we got a lot of it and uh, you're extrapolating. Who do you think you are? I am. <laughs> <laughs> all right. All right. Let's see how you did. Uh, Mike told everyone to go to hell because he, uh, he thought he was ahead of the game. So number one, fanfic, you said. That was fanfic. Okay. Uh, written by Khan. That was uh, the uh, Do They Know Who I Am, the Yellow Teeth. You might not be getting the tour of the city after all. Right. Off uh, to a good start. Number two, that was uh, the nutritious drink at the Velderhof Country Club and the lecture tours in North Rhine, Westphalia. You said fanfic. That was fanfic written by Jens. I did not really realize how ridiculous that one sounded until I read it out loud. (laughs) (laughs) And I had sort of forgotten the, uh, the smoothies post, uh, post squash matches. Sure. Um, but, uh, he's doing the Iocane powder thing with that one. Number three, this was Brinkerhoff Midge and the return of director Leland Fontaine. You said fanfic that is real from later in the book. Oh, come on. (laughs) That (laughs) That was submitted by uh, Janelle. Um, Yep, Midge, I Wait, guess, is someone... submitted by her. 
Well, she just said, like, this might be a good one to try and fool oh, with. Oh, okay. Okay, yeah. gotcha. Number four, this is Jabba, the IT guy, giant tadpole. <laughs> that is, uh, you said fanfic. That is very much real from later in the book. No. We've got, <laughs> we've got Jabba uh, wolfing down his third pepperoni calzone and uh, Wait, hitting on so Midge. The two, the two Midge things are the real things? <laughs> I didn't realize sort of the Midge was so prominent. I sort of picked these at this this morning. So, uh, yeah, Midge uh, look, is. Uh, I, I appeal to everyone listening. What would you do in my situation <laughs> when you hear of Jabba and Midge? You obviously come on. I just uh, I was like I I gotta I gotta get some real ones. I scrolled. I just scrolled randomly in the dock. Came to something. I saw Jabba, and I was like, hmm. And it was like the you know named for the hairless tadpole. I was like, well, this is going but, in. But Chartrukian is the guy who's tending to the. He's already. We already have a. Please, a please. He's system guy. security. This guy is, I think, IT. Maybe also system security. <laughs> Okay. Yeah, so utterly revolting. I mean, <laughs> leaning full into the uh, mid-90s IT guy stereotype. Oh, man, that is terrible. That <laughs> Coughing is terrible. as he swallows mouthfuls. Yeah, so I'm really looking forward to that. Can't wait to see if Jabba he, ever interacts with He's eating with, uh... three calzones? Yes. Oh, my God. All right. Okay. All um, right, and, so and I we failed have... in my mission here, but w- what the last one I assume is fanfic. The last one... Uh, was the uh, oh the 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 throaty tanned cleavage Rocosio yeah. Eva Granada? Uh, you said real. You said fanfic. That is real. That is from later what? in the book. Yes. Yeah, so the last three things, Midge <laughs> and the another, tanned Iberian skin, are real. Yeah, another uh, incredibly hot woman uh, who's everyone is gawking over and throatily saying things. That's the uh, dewdrop from the. Uh, I think we we get introduced we to her by the end of the dewdrop, book. Yeah. So. Um, yeah, oh, this, this was uh, this was diabolical. You have to admit this. Is, I uh, yeah. I well, there was. Uh, I mean, sometimes you 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 go through looking for real stuff, and you you either burn the good ones or. Um, but this one seems to have a, an abundance of rich riches, and I sort of looked in the uh, in the first half of the book only. I uh, I make no apologies for my choices on this one. I know I <laughs> failed. I'll, I'll admit it, but. Uh, Jabba, Again, you could but, not have. I mean, that's the yeah. sort of thing that if it was fanfic, I would probably say settle down. Of we course, need to, we yes. need to do something that would actually you trick him through. <laughs> you, you, you have to have better standards than this, please. <laughs> oh. My God, that's amazing. Right. So, Jabba the IT guy fan art, everybody. That's our our challenge. Um, but yeah, knowing that what we do about that, we have a lot to look forward to. But let's move on to uh, to uh, chapter sixteen. I'm still. Uh, I know you've been thrown for a loop. I'm shaking my damn head here. <laughs> wow. All right. Chapter 16. Yeah. Uh, it's, he's explaining to her what the setback was. He, he tells her it's been a ring. A ring? Susan looked doubtful. Tankado's missing a ring? Yes. We're lucky David caught it. It was a real heads up play. <laughs> Which a, a lot of people <laughs> sent that in as a dumb sentence. Um, I guess it's that sort of. Uh, uh, corporate NSA speak we all come to know and love, but uh, again, he's he's grateful that David is the uh, world's greatest detective. Um, but he he says a puzzling thing. Um, You're after a pass key, not jewelry. I know Strathmore said in his gravelly voice, just mm-hmm. reminding people. But I think they might be one and the same. <laughs> Susan looked lost. It's a long story. No, it's not. <laughs> what, what you, it is not a long story at all. It is not a long story. And why does she look lost? She's, she's a genius. A, well, her IQ is sometimes gets in the way. I feel like I the suppose, computer just yeah. like starts to scan in the wrong places. It's like how you know uh, the beautiful mind guy. He would have trouble with uh, you know day to day relationships because he was always one step ahead. She has trouble with uh, you know understanding things that she should understand right. because of her IQ. <laughs> that just gets in the way. It's right. a blessing and a curse. Well, I guess a curse, really, mostly. Uh, there's a great thing in the. Uh, I'm a big fan of the Sherlock Holmes BBC from the 80s and I guess 90s too. Uh, he He's so smart. I forget the, oh God, I can't remember the actor's name. He's so good. But in order to prove that he's human at times, he does a thing where he just does a fake smile just to show people that I'm human and it's obviously not felt at all. <laughs> he just does a thing where he raises the corners of his mouth and it's very funny. Like his eyes are not involved at all. It's like, I'm human, just reminding you that that's what Susan must be like all the time because right. of her 
That's her tight like, smile, I guess. Versus yes, the... her mind is working at all times. <laughs> uh, but Strathmore here at the beginning, taking a swipe at Spain, right? Yes. He says, uh, why not? Spain isn't exactly the encryption capital of the world. <laughs> yes. Nobody would have any idea what the letters meant. Right. Bunch of Spaniards stumbling around, stepping on their own feet. Idiots. <laughs> yeah, he has it out for, uh, yeah, Spain's encryption uh, talent and the uh, Electronic Frontier Foundation. But even if it was the encryption capital of the world, the, the he looked at the letters, but it was a dying guy, like, waving it in his face and, and blathering. Like, what what kind of a, of a look at it is he going to get? Like, if they did that in the encryption capital of the world, people would immediately, like, interpret this as it's being, you know, thrust into their face. It's very stupid, is my point. It's it's very stupid. And then, so getting back to this thing I, I referenced earlier, he says, uh, this is Strathmore, I think, no, the Canadian story was so absurd that the officer figured he was either in shock or senile, so he put the old guy in the back of his motorcycle to take him back to his hotel, and that's when he fell off and uh, cracked his head and broke his wrist. His story was so absurd yeah he described this track it. at all i don't yeah. this is not human behavior what are you talking about he lucidly described a a fairly normal scenario um uh, and, and, and so he's saying look uh, and he's saying in spanish i'm sorry my spanish is not that good but this guy as he was having a heart attack took his ring off and handed it to me <laughs> I, I don't even know what you're saying, sir. I don't even understand the words that are coming out of your mouth. Okay, pops. Yeah. <laughs> yes. I mean, what? I mean, what? even if your immediate thought was not, there's probably a uh, world class encrypt- encryption algorithm embedded in this ring. You would think like, oh, I, you know, he probably wanted his children to have that. Um, you know, his 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 wife. You know, who who meant the world to him. He wanted to make sure that we got you know something like that. Right. He's a Japanese guy. His father was, you know, uh, in WW2 and right. uh, was one of the last guys on the island. And so he gave him this ring and he just wanted, you know, what could he do? He said, please give this to my wife. You know, like that is, that's not absurd at all. Like, right. I yes. don't understand this <laughs> plot point. Yeah. Um, but I also liked the thing that they watched that their instinct was uh, he's either in shock or senile. So, you know, what do you do? Uh, you know, your your elderly grandfather is like wandering the uh, old folks home at night. He's out of his room. He, he doesn't know where he is because um, he's, you know, he's senile or has dementia. Um, do you uh, calmly take him by the hand and lead him back to his room? Or do you ask him to hold on on the back of a motorcycle as you drive him <laughs> to his hotel? <laughs> and he promptly falls off and break his wrist. It's like the biggest uh, negligence of duty that I've ever heard of. And hilariously, the guy, as it turns out, I mean, we're getting ahead, but he's 63 years old or something. Right, yes. And so senile? I mean, you know, he's... Yeah, younger than both of my parents. He's he's uh, just a guy. <laughs> right, He's and he's like, a, yeah, we learned that he's, you know, gainfully employed and, and uh, you know... Sort of famous, actually. Sort of famous. So, like, yeah. yeah, he's he's holding down a job and uh, you know writing a national column. So it's yeah, it's it's hilarious. It's a in fact, he's rather funny and sharp tongued, <laughs> as we'll get to. But uh, yes, oh man, but yeah, so it's hilarious. I also like that they, uh, um, you know, Strathmore is almost losing patience with Susan um, as they describe. You know, it's the, the lettering. He says it's not Japanese. He said it was you know uh, Roman lettering, but it you know he said it looked like a cat had gotten loose on a typewriter. And Susan is hearing this, and evidently she's sitting there like drooling and going, "Duh!" He goes, "Susan, it's crystal clear. Tankado <laughs> engraved the digital fortress passkey on his ring." So he's just explaining. He's he's telling, not showing. You know, he engraved the digital fortress passkey on his ring. Gold is durable. <laughs> Whether he's sleeping, showering, eating, the passkey would always be with them, ready at a moment's notice for instant publication. I mean, I, I just, I liked that they threw in gold is durable there as if we were being like, but it would dissolve in the shower. You know, right. and also <laughs> like, I can't, you know, some of my friends like are able to do the thing where they have like a, you know, maybe a platinum or a steel ring and they can yeah. pop open a beer with it. And you can't do that with a gold ring because it is not super durable. It no, would, it's it, not it, nearly it, as durable. As it would metal. damage it immediately. It's pretty soft. God. <laughs> but the thing that made me laugh about that of the ad for gold, it suddenly sounded like one of those uh, hair replacement commercials. 
Like whether he's sleeping, showering, <laughs> eating, yes. he's good to go with his new gold <laughs> ring. Like why Why do you have to, it's, it's a thing that cracked us up for years. Bridget and I would, you know, get a package of crackers and on the back it would say, um, you know, at the park, at home, on the go. <laughs> like why do, why do the crackers have to tell me where I can take my crackers? Yeah, the I power of suggestion, I guess. work, I, I <laughs> I'll take them in the shower if I want. I mean, I understand that they're probably not optimal place to eat crackers, but uh, I'll do what I want with my crack. <laughs> Maybe five years ago, the uh, Nats radio broadcasts were running. They had a prominent ad campaign for Cholula, uh, where they they would just run that ad probably every three innings or so uh, with the iconic wooden cap. And uh, they would mm-hmm. say, you know, put it on, you know, these various foods, like you were just saying. And one of the ones they always suggested was popcorn. <laughs> Sprinkle his hot sauce on your popcorn. I was like, you know, I was like, you know, you hear it enough. And I'm like, I guess I'm going to try the hat. Like, that's so insane that like, maybe it will be good. I don't think I ever did. But, um, you know, so maybe that's what they were going for with crackers. No one thought to eat them in the park uh, until they suggested it. (laughs) Sleeping, showering, eating. Uh, But then Susan's reaction to it again, like you said, is she like, you need to shake that head, like get, get a restart on that 170 IQ. She looks dubious at him on his finger in the open like that. Is, is are those two things the things that you think of? Your finger in the open like that, like it's yeah. in the inside of his ring. Right. What are you talking yes. about? What <laughs> that was my interpretation, right? It's on the inside. Like I, my ring has our initials and the wedding date engraved on the inside of it. Um, I was assuming, yeah, that it's the the one ring, right? You throw it in the fire, and then on the inside, you can see mm-hmm. letters like. What? Even if it was on the outside, if you had rings in the, uh, you know, five point font that mine is in, uh, not a single one of my friends or family members would have ever picked up on what was no. on the outside of my wedding ring. No. The, so I don't know. Susan seems like a real dumbass. To me. Yes. I mean, yes. she's hot. I mean, don't get me wrong. I mean, yeah, maybe that's oh, the twist. Yeah. Everyone is just, you know, you know, treating her uh, differently, deferring to her as she stumbles upward at this job because she's uh, she's so hot. And then towards the end of this chapter, also, we get, uh, uh, he knew the only way we dare kill him is if we found North Dakota. Susan felt a chill. Of course, she whispered, Tankado, which you just read, again, you just read as North Dakota. Yeah. So, <laughs> uh, what is he doing with this? This can't be a thing that he's going to reveal later, right? Uh, I mean, it can't be. Can't, it's it's got to be like, ha ha! You were all looking here because you're dumbasses. You thought Tankado I, and North Dakota were similar, but they're not. I guess so. I hope so. I mean, I it's you know. But so what was what is the possibility? He has a brother. He's not really dead. He has a twin, etc. Yeah, I don't know. He hired know. A, yeah. a deformed guy to play him, or sure, something. I guess I, so. I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. Um, certainly, I don't think it would be beyond him to have a uh, you know soap opera twist. I think that that's a, a Dan Brown hallmark of this character who you were you know spent you know three hundred pages with and was good the entire time is now bad type of thing. So I think the this guy who you know the book literally started with him dying is alive would not be out of bounds. Yeah, just that's dumb, it. dumb as hell. Yeah, but you know, funny. <laughs> yeah. Chapter uh, seventeen. Yes. I think that starts with David Becker stepping out onto the scorching tile concourse of the <laughs> Plaza de España. Um, and at this uh, point, I was, I'm was i getting concerned because, like, David must be so hot and sweaty that he has to find a, a water fountain to shower off in. And I don't know I, what I mean, the— I, uh, does uh, uh, Seville have—I t- hope they have tons of them. Yeah, I, I, I do He's got to be doing know. it every couple minutes. I, I mean, fruit smoothies, hard to come by, but— uh, Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I don't know. I've never been— Have you been— to Seville? I think so. I mean, I, I think, uh, I don't know what's there, whether, but uh, I'm pretty sure I have just because I... Well, you uh, saw the scrotum, surely. Sure. Oh, yeah. I mean, you know, went, yeah. took a selfie with that. And uh, also, I think when I went to Seville, uh, I did this. It was a, uh, visited the Plaza España. Despite its history of military coups, fires, and public hangings, most tourists visited because the local brochures plugged it as the English military headquarters in the film Lawrence of Arabia. Mm-hmm. So that's why most people were visiting that brings there. In, that brings in people to <laughs> sites really? of splendor is really? the fact that they were in Lawrence of Arabia. <laughs> Obscure locations in uh, yeah, a film from the 60s. Right, right. 
Uh, but you know how I'm concerned that Susan might not be as smart as she says. I'm concerned that uh, Becker's not as smart as oh, no. I think he is because uh, so Becker wondered what could possibly be so important about a ring with lettering all over it. <laughs> Re- you Really? You're being asked to get it by the head of the NSA <laughs> and you wonder what could possibly be so important? Right. I mean – Th- think about it for three seconds and then oh. go, oh, there's lettering, so it's a code and we need it and it's important. Right. What? what he's, so he's a dumbass too, like an absolute <laughs> dumbass. Yes. Yeah. You don't, uh, you don't uh, understand what it is, but you must say something beyond my comprehension must hinge on, uh, on retrieving this if the, you know, you know, it has national security in its name. Right. Right. When, uh, you know, like we, uh, Uh, They want me to break the code that the Germans are sending in their U-boats, which are sinking the supply ships that are bringing stuff to England. Like, (laughs) okay, all right. (laughs) What could possibly be so important in these codes? Like, that's the point. You don't know what it is. Exactly. (laughs) Even if, you know, if someone's, you know, family asked you to retrieve a ring, you'd just be like, well, you know, there must be a reason behind what I uh, need to know. So, but, you know, it seems important to them. So you don't have to like puzzle out why. Uh, but also kind of a dumbass because we get this, uh, Strathmore had told Becker, use the 10,000 cash to buy the ring. If you have to, I'll reimburse you. That's not necessary. Becker had replied. He'd intended to return the money anyway. So we have him (laughs) getting the job because he needs the money, but then he's acting like it's a charity. Like he's going to be like, you know, oh, please, in NSA, you need this money more than I do. Like, but also, like, how in the God's name does he know it's unnecessary when he hasn't made an offer to buy the ring yet? <laughs> so right. he's like a triple dumbass. Yeah. Like, no, use the money. Use the money to buy the ring. Like, yes. no, that won't be necessary. No, no, it might cost no, like 10 times well what we be. gave you. Yeah, because it's yeah. very you know, important. You might need a thousand times that amount of money, and I'll wire you that, dumbass. Stop. Yeah. What are you talking about this at all for? It, it's fine. I'll just do uh, DoorDash for four years uh, when I get home to make it up for you. I mean, clearly, uh, you know, as a as a you're in, you're invested in destroying that EFF, so you're doing the public good. You need it more than I do. And and he's you know uh, as he's screaming at him over the phone like no use it. He, he I can't hear you. My head is in a fountain right now. I can't. <laughs> <laughs> oh, but yeah, he says, uh, he also refers to as an errand, which I didn't notice that it happened before, but you know, flying to, uh, you know, Spain in a private jet just stretches the, the definition of the word errand just slightly. Right. <laughs> but, uh, it, it is getting annoying at this point. His refusal to engage with, uh, currency at all is mm-hmm. just like, it's not a, this is not a charming trait. It is yeah. not character revealing. It is just very, very odd. Right. Like, here's an envelope of cash. I was told by the director to hand this to you. Like, no, I don't need that. Yeah. No, please. As though he's demurring when his aunt is trying to give him another birthday gift or something. Yes. Like, <laughs> shut up. What, right. You don't understand what you're talking about. It's right. not cute. It's not charming. It's not a thing at all. And the, it's, it goes against his, uh, you know, he's, he's always paying for the... Uh, for the dinners when he and Susan go out, despite her protestation. So it's just, you know, whatever the situation is, he's making the wrong choice when it comes to money. Right. I mean, those two, obviously they'll need counseling if they ever get married or anything like, you know, you two, uh, they are going to get, I mean, well, yeah, I guess you meant if they are, if they ever follow through with the wedding, but they are engaged. So you, you know, a lot of people go through that before they, you know, before the wedding actually happens. Right. I mean, a huge red flag for, uh, you know, I don't know if they're going to get married in, uh, a Roman Catholic church, they have to go through that, uh, the class and, you know, someone has to put their you know, uh, stamp on it and say, yeah, you're good to go. But I, I would be going, no, I don't think you got a weird <laughs> money thing going on. Exactly. It's not going to work out. I mean, she has a high, you know, the highest level of security clearance. So I imagine there's probably a, you know, prenup that goes along with that as well. And so, you know, you might want to deal with the uh, finances yeah. uh, before that happens. Don't give away $10,000 when it falls into your lap would be something I would, uh, I would have an issue with. As your counselor, I, I have to say, Susan, you are obviously incredibly, incredibly hot as I, <laughs> as I look at your bra, just barely visible below. And, and David, Mr. Backer, you, uh, 
Your thick hair is certainly impressive. However, you two should not marry. You yes. should not marry. Susan, he is a triple dumbass. <laughs> <laughs> Father, please. Uh, uh, that's all I have for 17. Uh, I, I had one more uh, one more uh, thing. He, he keeps trying to call Susan, um, but keeps getting her machine, I guess. And uh, he, he listens to the message this time. Where is she? By now, Susan would be panicked. He wondered if maybe she'd gone on to Stone Manor without him. So that's where they were supposed to be going on their romantic vacation. So he thinks she, by now she must be panicked. Maybe she's taken a vacation in a panic <laughs> is, is, is his back-to-back sequential thoughts. Um, but he also, he had called her, right, when she was having her little, she was moaning and thinking of him, and then he called. Yeah, in the morning, yep. And he didn't tell her where he was going. Yeah, right. I think because he, he could f- have, right? Uh, he figured that, you know, it was her boss, so it was a matter of security. It's it's another stupid thing. It's it's, by, just, it's dumb. And now he's trying it, to find a phone booth in the, uh, you know, he's, he, you can't. You, you're, you'll melt in that sun. Don't even try to make a call. Yeah, I wondered about that, too, because it ends with saying uh, David was too preoccupied to see the man in wire rim glasses watching from across the street. So I don't know, yeah, how that guy is dealing with this, uh, with the, the melting or the thing that he has a parasol, but uh, we're left to puzzle about that. That's the main mystery that I have uh, invested myself in so far. That is the the dumbest thing in the world. I, I was just, <laughs> you just have to imagine, like, which movie is he thinking of? Is it like the Indiana Jones guy with the wire yep, room that's what glasses? I thought. My first yes. thought, yes, 100%. Okay. Okay. <laughs> All right. Uh, and, yeah, and, you know, maybe it's, you know, the hottest day of the year. That's when, like, I think uh, Do the Right Thing took place on, where everyone's AC is broken and everyone's irritated and angry. So that's got to be the... Right, uh, right. I think Rear Window has that, too. It's super yeah. hot. So they all, they all left their windows open. <laughs> Uh, second Hitchcock reference of this, uh, broadcast. But all right. Well, we can get, uh, we, we, we're not all rigs people. We have, <laughs> <laughs> we've conducted, uh, discreet internet searches about other stuff too. Uh, chapter 18. Oh yeah. Another brief one. I have a single note about this worthless chapter. <laughs> I think we just go back to Numa Numa and it's basically the same thing. Yeah. He's waiting uh, for the guy to call him back for his $20 million offer. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we did get one more, uh, you know, Ernest Klein's uh, description of Japan. He says, although Japan was changing, Numataka had been trained in the old school. He lived by the code of Menboko, honor and face. Imperfection was not to be tolerated. Oh, this is, he, if he hired a cripple, he would bring shame on his company. He had disposed of Tankado's resume without a glance. So that's, you know, a little bit of uh, backstory that I guess Tankado wanted to work there, but he uh, he was too invested in his honor to uh, <laughs> to allow him to. Uh, and Numa Numa checked his watch again. The American North Dakota should have <laughs> called by now. <laughs> so the Japanese businessman has no problem. Like, oh, uh, Americans are weird. They call themselves North Dakota. I, what, what am, who am I to uh, yes. disparage their weird choices? Oh, man. Dumb. Uh, but yeah, moving on to chapter 19. That's We go back to the NSA. Chartrukian's um, back, baby. <laughs> yeah, so they're in the uh, Nerf hoop room, but uh, Chartrukian comes on over, and he's a he's a nervous dude. Mm-hmm. Um, well, yeah, he, Chartrukian had his face pressed against the pane and was pounding fiercely, straining to see through. Yeah, um, you're fired, Chartrukian. Yeah, Get your exactly. greasy mug off of our. Yeah, this is clearly the most secure place in the thing. You're, if, you, if you're not invited in, we don't want you in. Knock right. it off. Banging against the one-way glass. <laughs> like, <laughs> um, uh, this, this makes uh, the upcoming Jabba look a little more dignified. It does, yes. <laughs> he has his pepper, pepperoni calzone in one hand, smearing it as he presses his face up. Before he comes in, though, I just want to touch on one more avoidable mistake. Sure. Um, we get a little background of... Uh, of the triangle of uh, David Strathmore and, and uh, Susan. Could David be in danger? Strathmore st- shook his head. Nobody else knows the ring exists. That's why I sent David. He, I wanted to keep it that way. Curious spooks don't usually tail Spanish teachers. He's a professor, Susan corrected, immediately regretting the clarification. Every now and then, Susan got the feeling David wasn't good enough for the commander, that he somehow thought she could do better than a school teacher. And it's just like, come on, man. Like... 
if you wanted to do that, you could have done that. You made him the head of a department at Georgetown University, yes. <laughs> prestigious <laughs> private university. Like, you know, again, you could make him have lost the Georgetown job and now having to be teaching at a community college. You could make him a noble high school Spanish teacher or a Teach for America guy. But, you know, he's on the run for tenure and a lifetime gig doing this. It's so dumb. Well, why does uh, it doesn't speak well of Strathmore that that's his slam on him? Yeah, like, the, what, yeah, the guy that he what? hired yes. to do this, the expert. It's so stupid. Then again, he only hired him because he spoke the language. So, uh, but yeah, he's not. Uh, it, it's not like knocked up or something where he like, yes, that this, guy. I mean, a slob. On. Yeah. No. Yeah, it's amazing because yeah, it's so easy to do that. You just look at it, and it's uh, anyway. Uh, now, Chartruckian here uh, turns into Jerry Lewis around uh, <laughs> around her. Here's, a, here's an impression, or here's a, his description of her. Susan intimidated the hell out of him. Her mind worked on a different plane. I guess he's talking about when she couldn't understand why rings could possibly <laughs> conceal information. She was unsettlingly beautiful. Is that a thing? Ah, I... uh, that's yeah. That that was something to try to think of, like who that would possibly be. Who's unsettling, unsettlingly beautiful? I think some, you know, I, you know, uh, Melania Trump. That sort of like super made up type of voice, where it's like I know what she's going for, but like it doesn't, you know, you, you protest too much kind of thing. Uh, again, uh, didn't we talk about it before with uh, uh, Julia Roberts walking down the stairs sure, and like, this yeah. is the best part of my day? That's what it's supposed to be, right? Like guys just going, you know, yeah, Phoebe falling Cates. Down. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Unsettling. But and the, his yeah. words always seem to get jumbled around her. So you're a, a top hire at the NSA. You're a part of the inner circle mm-hmm. and you walk into a room with a an attractive woman and you go <laughs> Susan's unassuming air made it even worse. Right. Yeah. So he's uh you know spilling coffee down his pants. He's like, Yeah, and he's hitting his head on the corner of the refrigerator and bleeding all over and going <laughs> Right. But it's not like she's, you know, so yeah, Jessica Rabbit, I think would be another, uh, you know, unsettlingly right. beautiful <laughs> type of thing. But, you know, at least Jessica Rabbit is like, you know, laying it on thick, you know, with her uh, her whole act. But, you know, Susan is just sort of like, you know, an unassuming heir. It's not like she's, you know, pushing him in his face or anything. Right. She's not like tracing a finger down the middle of her cleavage, you know, and <laughs> That's painting. Right. She's not Tying putting a cherry her... stem with her tongue, right. like <laughs> putting a finger on his uh, bottom lip and like yes. <laughs> tracing around his. <laughs> He's just walking into a room where they're talking about, uh, you know, retrieving a ring from Seville, and he's like, oh. <laughs> yeah. yeah, he 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 squeezes his pepperoni calzone and uh, the cheese and pepperoni shoots <laughs> out the top of it into his. <laughs> Yeah, it's uh, it's a. It, I mean, as we see, it keeps going with the uh, the attractive woman the German is with. So it just is. It brings me no delight because it just. I just don't know. He wrote this when he was probably my age, and it's a. Uh, it it doesn't. Uh, I don't know. Reflect well. <laughs> it doesn't speak well. No, it does not. It does not. Uh, but it's a weird chapter because it, it hinges on Chartruckian not believing. His director or just being it's it's just sort of a vague like, well, I don't know. And he's telling him, no, we did that. It's fine. Mm-hmm. Go away. To which when you're talking to the director of your you would just go, OK, yeah. that's fine. I mean, sure. I, if you're not worried, I'm not worried. I'm out of here. I'll, I'll go take my day off. I'm going to go play a Frisbee golf in the park. <laughs> right. Well, so, for example, if someone at, at Rift Tracks, you know, was just like, oh, like we don't need to get into that. We'd be like, oh, you know, um you know, weird, but like, you know, they don't want to talk about it. This is a, the NSA where things, you know, again, levels of security up to like the highest in the entire world. And so someone says, you don't need to know about that. And the guy's like, son of a bitch. Like, you know, I I don't believe you. Like, it's like, there's secrets everywhere. Yes. (laughs) That's what we do. We trade in it and I'm telling (laughs) you. And if I told you like, okay, so I'll tell you. And now a, there's going to be a red dot on your head and your head is going to explode against the wall. Right. Exactly. Uh So um, do you really want to know more about this? Right. Uh, But but it does get. Chartruckian gets the chapter stinger for that. 
Yeah, it's uh, there's there's some great uh, as we had her. What was she pressing enter and sitting back and waiting earlier? Yes, we get some we get some dramatic some dramatic dialogue. So Chartrukin has just been sort of dressed down uh, in front of the hot woman, and he's he's upset, so he's fuming. But uh, when you're fuming about the uh, cis sec operation, the NSA, it comes out pretty funny. A diagnostic, my ass. What kind of looping function keeps three me three million processors busy for sixteen hours? So he's you know he's just red faced and bawling his fist as he says that. The Bemoaning oath, looping functions. The oath Chartrukian had taken when he joined Sissac began running through his head. <laughs> he took an oath. <laughs> I mean, it's possible. It seems probably illegal, but whatever. Sure, yeah. He had I mean, sworn to use his expertise, training, and instinct to protect the NSA's multi-billion-dollar investment. So there was a, a classroom of people, and like, hold up your right hand, put your left hand on this Bible, Chartrukian, do you <laughs> swear to uh, keep the uh, use your expertise, training, and instinct to protect Trenzer? <laughs> yes. I swear it. Yeah. My God. I will jump in the jaws of a lion to protect this computer. <laughs> All right, Chartrukian, you're on the team. Uh, so at the end of it... Yeah. They don't could, even emphasize that it's like in the interest of national security. They emphasize the value of the investment. Yes, yes. He's <laughs> just talking about, you know, look, we uh, you know, we got this new computer. It's got a gig of memory in it. I'll, <laughs> I'll jump on a grenade for that thing. Yeah, I he puts his hand, hand on the table. He's like, you can take my pinky. That's how much I value this. <laughs> He's uh, G. Gordon Liddy holding his hand over the candle until his flesh roasts. <laughs> That's my commitment <laughs> to protecting this hard drive. <laughs> uh, so he ends the chapter with, your baby's in trouble, Commander. He grumbled, you don't trust instinct? I'll get you proof. And then he pressed his greasy face against the window. <laughs> is, that, that, is that the last sentence of it? That's he the also, last sentence of the thing. I'll get you proof. So I think right before that, defiantly, Chartrukian strode over to the terminal and fired up Translator's complete array of system assessment software. <laughs> so, baby, if you wanted to fo- programmers defiantly firing up system assessment software, this is, <laughs> damn it, this is the book for you. How you... <laughs> Well, I wonder the times where he didn't do it defiantly. I wonder if you could tell, uh, you know, yeah, exactly. side by side pictures of him firing them up. Yeah, that should be a computer <laughs> game in a bar. Like, can <laughs> right. you spot the difference between Chartrucky and right firing up? I was messing around with some, uh, you know, music software the other day, and it, it responds to a key press in terms of like the how how hard a, a drum is hit or something like that. So, like that could be, you know, yeah. how how uh, how. Uh, emphatically, he pressed control enter might be how defiant he was in his right firing up. Uh, here's, well, hang on. I just got to brush off some of Jabba's uh, pizza <laughs> drippings here. And then I will. But trust me, this is defiant. The way I'm doing it is defiant. I have to get some Windex. And, uh, oh, I'm so glad we have Jabba to look forward to. <laughs> yes. And Midge, I can't wait for Midge. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, because I, they, the, those two things sort of assumed that you knew who she was. So uh, are we gonna, you know, what's your, what's your, just based entirely on uh, stereotypes about that name? Is Midge gonna match the uh, other women in the book so far, or I think Midge is going to show even more bra. I think she's <laughs> gonna be even hotter. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, she's it's gonna be like if you thought Susan was hot. Right. She, he's just going to get a load of Midge. He's going to completely punt and just be like, I don't know. Midge looked exactly like Elle McPherson. OK, <laughs> so now she's now she's job is hitting on her. Let's move on. Uh, Chartrukian has to go from uh, from Susan to Midge. And he basically <laughs> his heart explodes as he walks into, you know. He's yeah, already he's, cut himself on on every surface available when he talks to Susan. But then Midge is just off the he, charts. Beautiful. He, He's like the chef in Ratatouille when the rat was figuring out how to control him for the first time. <laughs> Just limbs flailing and like, you know. <laughs> oh, my God. Absurd. Yeah, All it right. really is. Uh, chapter 20 goes back to Becker in uh, in uh, España. And oh, it, my it, God. This is quite a bang. This chapter yeah. 20 opens with a bang. If you, uh, do you got it there in front of you? I think so. Uh, but uh, you can go ahead. He goes to the hospital. The Yes, he's in the hospital. The air smelled of urine. 
<laughs> the lights at the far end were blown out, and the last 40 or 50 feet revealed nothing but muted silhouettes. Here, here are those muted silhouettes. A bleeding woman. He paints quite a picture. Mm-hmm. A young couple <laughs> crying. A little girl praying. <laughs> Becker reached the end of the darkened hall. The door to his left was slightly ajar, and he pushed it open. He's looking for a Canadian man. Yes. <laughs> it was entirely empty except for an old withered woman naked on a cot struggling with her bedpan. <laughs> thank, you, thank you, Dan Brown. Thank you so much. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's a... Uh... That's a potential robot pimp scenario for uh, any character entering a room. Oh, withered. The the woman responds like, I'm 97. I'm, yeah, you know, just... I, I, I have no insurance. Jeez. Yeah, life well lived. You know, my great grandkids were just here visiting me. Like, leave me yes. alone. Um, but yeah, I so that- I didn't but that... invite you to come in and look at me. <laughs> yeah, so he goes to a hospital and starts barging into doors in this thing. He sees people coughing up blood and his instinct is to just start like barging into these areas. Like, I, I don't know why this hospital's so bad, but uh, that's the old, that's all we get of the old woman, unfortunately. Yeah, unfortunately. But it's like Danny uh, Torrance, like, biking around the Overlook here. Like, you know, seeing the the bear suit guy and the old woman in the tub and stuff. Um, But a bleeding woman. (laughs) Uh, Any instinct to... You know, get her help. Like, is is anyone tending to her? She's just right. by herself bleeding. <laughs> but he, he sort of walks s- past her. Like, hey, good luck with that bleeding, there, woman. Yeah. Are you in line? I. Uh, I... <laughs> but he. This is a Dan Brownism. Like, I think he said it before, but he just says it was like some eerie, sort of eerie set conjured up for a Hollywood horror flick. So we oh, just joked God. about saying she looked like Elle McPherson, but that's essentially just, he just says, yeah, you, you, have you been to a creepy hospital in like, uh, you know, Silent Hill, Resident Evil? It's like that. Yeah. Yeah. Lights are, fl- the obviously the lights are flickering and, and all of that stuff. I almost spit taked when you went straight to the air smelled of urine. <laughs> 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 but yeah, so I don't know if this is supposed to be like a slam on Spain or, or Yes, or, he obviously oh, yeah, it, has a big problem with Spain. Because he says this now. He, he goes to try to get, get some records, you know, find out where the Canadian is. But he says the line was about 10 people deep, everyone pushing and shouting. Spain was not known for its efficiency. So these are the two things I've I've learned about Spain is that you know cruel sun and and, and lack of efficiency. Oh w- no, you know one more thing. You're not uh, exactly the head of cryptography. In the, <laughs> so if someone dies Man. with a crypto ring there, uh, the Spanish people are going to look around going, huh? I don't know. <laughs> Maybe if they keep stacking up, we'll have to have my friend uh, Javier on. He uh, yes, <laughs> r- run these stereotypes by him. These all seem like things that could have been. Uh, could have been uh, sourced from a very certain facts-based website, if ah, you ask me. Yeah, yes, <laughs> indeed. Uh, here's, here's a real action sentence. So he goes, he realizes he can't wait in line, right? So he, like, runs around and he sees a, uh, 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 I think it's a um, gym or something. And there's hospital beds in the gym. Yeah. In the far corner, just beneath a burned-out scoreboard, was an old payphone. Becker hoped it worked. <laughs> that was a real action thing. Watching your hero hoping something. <laughs> right. Isn't that, isn't that a weird phrasing? Like, Becker hoped it worked? Like, uh, that is when he does those dumb, like, italicized things of people thinking things, wouldn't that be a time to go, I hope it works? Yes. Instead of Becker hoped it worked. <laughs> it just struck me as a really dumb sentence, like a, a stupid way to... Yeah, I guess we all go around hoping things work. But, right, yeah. But do we do it as a thing it, of, maybe. A, an action thing? Like, <laughs> God, I, I hope that works. <laughs> it's And it's also 1997 or so. So, like, you know, they, you, you, you take it for granted unless, uh, you know, I guess it's, it's a pretty shitty hospital where grannies are peeing in bedpans and stuff. So you might that might be the reason he assumed it didn't. But most payphones worked in 1997. Yes, he swallowed his aspirin. He hoped it dulled his pain. Like, yeah, I mean, those things yeah. are sort of built into how we use things. He stepped with his light foot, right foot. He hoped that his central <laughs> nervous system would indicate to his left leg that it should take the next step, propelling him forward in an uh, ambulatory motion. Right. 
Uh, uh, but th- th- talk about drama. I, I don't. I, it was mostly just describing this, and the obviously the woman peeing was the high, high highlight of the chapter for me. But it had a very dramatic ending. I mean, obviously, that was the highlight for you. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> I did some uh, discreet internet searches to, to confirm how that all worked. But <laughs> um, but if you don't have anything else, uh, I do. I, I have the end of the chapter. Yes, it struck me as very funny. Very funny. Very dramatic. Um, here it is, and and all. Yeah, the chapter Jazz end is it up, good, give it but, the... but it's missing something. Okay. Uh, and so I'll add that on. Uh, so Becker wheeled and slammed the receiver back down on his cradle. Then he turned and stared back into the room in stunned silence. There on a cot, directly in front of him, propped up on a pile of old pillows, lay an elderly man with a clean white cast on his right <laughs> wrist. How's it going, eh? <laughs> it was the Canadian, Becker thought. <laughs> Uh, everything was real up until how's it going? How's it going? Yes, <laughs> right. <laughs> he's, he's looking for an old Canadian guy. Yeah. There he is. Yeah, ketchup chips. <laughs> oh, how about some poutine, eh? Uh, but yeah, I, I like that. Is you know, the, all the other things have been like he didn't notice the man watching him. He had no idea how bad his day was about to get. Yeah, there was an old man with a cast lying on his side. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, no, no, uh, indication of whether or not he's urinating. Uh, yeah, exactly. Can we get but, some uh, info on that. Yeah. You know, but, uh, you know, fool me, fool me once on that. You don't doubt that this elderly person's going to struggle with a bedpan. Oh, I'm not, sure. uh, I know where my money's on for this guy. <laughs> <laughs> oh. uh, uh, chapter 21 had nothing of interest to me. More nope, Numa Numa negotiations. Yeah. That's, uh, Numa Numa, right? Mm-hmm. Yep. Ta- just talking of- with North Dakota. Yeah, I think he's saying, like, we'll call you back or something. It's, uh, again, it seems like sort of an afterthought, just like that uh, simulation software. Okay, so this is where I asked the question. Just predict it. So who is North Dakota? Is it um, Charcuterie or whatever the hell his name is? Or Chartrukian? Is it, yes, or is it Stratham? Or is it the director? I think that... Um, or is it someone... I mean, are there any other characters? <laughs> my, def- my my guess is a Tonkato not dead or twin or something like that. Okay. I, think that right. what's, I think that what's his name is a bad guy, Strathmore, or he's going to do some bad things to get sure. what he wants. Sure. Um, so he's far, he's I don't not know. doing good things like spreading lies about uh, <laughs> dumping toxic Nuclear waste, waste when yeah. he's spying on people. <laughs> <laughs> he's going to do something other than the very, very good things he's been doing. Right. It is very funny. I mean, I guess you know that's the that's the classic uh, you know question is, is is are these invasions of all this worth uh, lives and stuff? So, the, but but Dan Brown has not uh, delved into the ethics of that type of situation yet. All he's done is say like, no, this is good. Uh, take our word for it. We're also pretending we're dumping nuclear waste. I think it's going to all, all of that is going to be put in the mouth of Jabba and it's going to be this <laughs> very thoughtful. It's going to take in all points of consideration, philosophy, ethics, yep. morals. As he whistle blows, that as, will be uh, <laughs> as he's pounding of his fourth <laughs> pizza. Yeah. At, at the table of the UN as he's delivering a, uh, a speech that triggers a standing ovation as he <laughs> he licked the uh, Cheeto dust off his left pinky finger and then completed <laughs> his diatribe. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, chapter 22 is the last chapter we have, and it uh, it mainly deals with him interrogating the uh, the old Canadian man. This is, again... Dan Brown opened the humor bag, and he should have Ooh. just kept it closed. Hachi machi. Oh man, what do you what do you got for this? Well, it starts with him. Uh, starts with uh, David says, uh, "Sir," Becker said, over pronouncing his words as if he was speaking to a deaf person. I need to ask you a few questions, and I understand what he's getting at here. The way you do this in a in a country you don't speak the language. But you would really have to overpronounce the hell out of your words to to get a deaf person to hear them, right? <laughs> yes. Unless I'm misunderstanding what that what what that means, a deaf person cannot hear you. <laughs> yes. No matter how loud you you yell at them, like <laughs> don't do that. Don't go and uh, just continue to get louder if the deaf person is signing at you that they cannot hear you. Yep, he's an ugly American from like a '70s movie or something. Like, yes. sir. Uh, you don't speak the language, so let me speak a yeah. little louder. Emphatic pointing and, yeah, talking louder. I've been there. <laughs> yes. Uh, so, yeah, this guy is a, as it turns out, uh, do I have his name here? 
Uh, Clouchard. A, yes. <laughs> uh, he's, um, what do you call him? He's uh, the Michelin man, you know, the Michelin guide guy. Yeah. He's a uh, very famous syndicated travel columnist for the Montreal Times. So it's a fun little uh, blast from the past in terms of that being a thing. <laughs> and let's uh, let's give you a little bit of his humor. Mayor Delors, I understand perfectly. He wagged a bony finger at Becker, and his voice echoed through the gymnasium. You're not the first. They tried the same... Oh, maybe my Canadian accent. Oh, boy. Okay, sure. They tried the same thing at the Moulin Rouge, Brown's Palace, in the Gulf, <laughs> Figno, and Lagnos. But what went to press? The truth. The worst Wellington I've ever eaten, the filthiest tub I've ever seen, and the rockiest beach I've ever walked. My <laughs> readers expect no less. Uh, yeah. So a guy comes up to you and goes, sir, sir, <laughs> and this is what you say to him. <laughs> that's, uh, that's Dan Brown's humor. Yeah, it's... Uh... I, I like, you know, that it specified French Canadian. So let's just ignore that and do the uh, McKenzie brothers. <laughs> <laughs> well, it is it good. It makes speaks... everything a lot funnier. Yeah. Uh, French Canadian. I don't speak Quebecois. Do you? No. Oh, God. No. I. Whenever I go there, people speak French to you in a restaurant and I do the, huh? And then they look at me and go, oh, right. A moron. Like, <laughs> here we go, sir. What, what would you like to drink? And I'm like, ah, oh, much better. Thank you. Aren't, aren't but also, they, I've heard that there are a little more uh, sticklers there than they are actually, I mean, obviously, like in Paris and everything you can get by. But well. When, when I was in the south of France, there was a little bit of struggle there, but I've heard it, it can be a little worse for an American if you just have I, nothing. I think, you know, when you go to Par to France, something about, you know, the way we look, dress, do our hair tips us off. In Montreal, it's a little less so, so I don't think that they're in the habit of judging you right away as an American. Okay. Um, so, so I think that they go with French when you stare at them. I haven't, I haven't even bothered how to say English, you know, English see you play. Of course I could, but um, I usually just stare. Yeah. No, that's a, that's it feels a, good, you know, when you sure, go to, when you technique. went to Tijuana, Ensenada, people would say it right away, but um, that was because you, you know, they knew where you came from. Right. Well, anyway, let's suffice it to say that this character is not subtle, he sucks. Nor are his descriptions of other characters subtle. <laughs> the German in the park comes to mind. Yes. The, the, uh, uh, let me just read this. Uh, yeah. The German in the park. I told the officer about him. I refused the ring, but the fascist swine accepted it. <laughs> and then a couple of sentences later. Absolutely. No woman. He's with a woman. No woman that beautiful would be with a man like that unless she were well paid. Mon Dieu. He was fat, fat, fat. <laughs> A loud mouth, overweight, obnoxious German. <laughs> wow. Yeah. So Dan Brown, humor, subtlety, they're all coming into play in chapter 22. And like, wh why is everyone just a, an, ob an obese slob? It's amazing. We have Jabba. Know. We have thick flesh, flesh Strathmore. We have this German guy. And then, uh, then the women are just goddesses strutting around and, uh, you know, turning heads wherever they go. It's so weird. So what have we learned? We learned a lot about Spain. We've learned about French Canadians and their attitudes and their <laughs> attitudes towards the Germans. I, I, I don't know if Dan yeah. Brown has a very nuanced grasp. Are these things? Yeah. Of the and, world. I, and so David sort of ingratiates himself to the French Canadian. So yeah, French Canadians, this, the, you know, Montreal, the reputation would be, you know, snooty. Uh, Montreal is a more European city, that type of uh, sure. thing. If you wanted to get into stereotypes, uh, but then so David butters him up by saying, as I'm sure a man of your stature is well aware, the Canadian government works hard to protect its countrymen from the indignity suffered in these, er, mm, shall we say, less refined countries. Clouchard's lips, thin lips parted in a knowing smile. So again, I was just thinking like, are we in the dark in terms of thinking that Spain is a perfectly fine place to visit if not incredibly cultured romantic and has great food like right, right. what on earth is going on like it is probably one of the most visited yeah honeymoon right? destinations is, yeah is exactly huge. people love to i've been there twice like it's it's a people feel very comfortable in palaces uh the alhambra like it's just <laughs> it's not like he's talking about um you know winnipeg or something yeah, and, but something about this chapter struck me is that this is a longer chapter. Yes. And so I, I feel like he thought he really hit on something. Like, you know, I don't know if you've ever written something and you feel like you kind of have to write your way into it. 
where at a certain point, like, okay, now I've found... The juices are flowing. Yeah, the thing. thing that I want. The first two chapters I can go back and look at because I haven't really... Haven't found my way, but now I've hit my stride, and now I know mm -hmm. what this thing is about. Yep. And I think he thought that he was here <laughs> with, because he let the pen flow. He just let it go here. Man. And it goes on and on, and it is just wretched. Truly, yes. And the, <laughs> the scene at the end of it where he tries to get the, the, oh my God. the complaining man to, uh, to give him the code, I thought oh. of a, a number of things, but one of them I thought of was uh, – a Fish Called Wanda. Have you ever seen that? Oh, a long time ago. And at the end of it, uh, uh, John Cleese tries to get the the stuttering character to say the name of the hotel where the other guy's going. And it goes on and on. Oh, and yeah. It's very comic, you know. But that's what this was. It's like, just just, just say the word. What? Wh where did he go? Where did he go? Well, I... Oh, 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 no, I'm alive again. Oh, yeah. yes, yes. It was just so stupid. And <laughs> Spit it out. <laughs> yes. Yeah, it's uh, yeah. Sing so it, they, sing it, sing it now. Yeah. You know, just uh, it's the combination so of that. I just started underlining them because he's having this conversation, uh, talking about how he didn't get the ring. The German took the ring. The German was a fat slob. Yes. Um, uh, he also so he also identifies the woman that he's with, who we we saw in real fanfic as a as a uh, escort. And says that you know he the German had been bragging that he had her all weekend for three hundred dollars. Yeah. So Again, this like, German is just shouting this out in a park. Yeah, exactly. What, what? is it? <laughs> and David has an uh, envelope with ten thousand dollars in it. Is my first uh, my first thought. So. I mean, if this oh, yeah. if the whole whole weekend that again, you know, another another check mark in Spain's column. If that's the uh, if you can have that good of a time over that there, is, that is a bargain. <laughs> I, didn't th I didn't think about the pricing system there more, but I was more thinking about so Japanese guys guy dies, hands a ring to a French Canadian uh, hotel reviewer or restaurant reviewer, mm -hmm. and then a giantly fat, fat, fat German slithers uh, over takes it from him and shouts out that he's with a prostitute <laughs> just, <laughs> i just want to see what the scene is what is yeah. happening here and the detectives think nothing amiss here well it is pretty hot today so, yeah you know this this kind of thing is gonna happen and that man in his uh early 60s man what a senile idiot <laughs> let's put him on the back of a motorcycle and dump him off. <laughs> it is. If it was a comedy, it would be very funny. It's like a Where's Waldo sort of like spot the uh, fat German, spot yeah. the stunning cheap prostitute. Um, but and getting back to that, he he's having a completely normal conversation. He, the Clouchard's tossing off Bon Mots. Uh, just you know, they're they're having laughs together. But then Clouchard dabbed at his forehead. His burst of enthusiasm had taken its toll. He suddenly looked ill. And then we get his strength was fading. He was suddenly looking pale. Clouchard was fading fast. He's not fading fast. You're doling out this garbage, uh, you know, paragraph by paragraph. And yeah. then... Uh, Stay with me, old fella. <laughs> so, but like we know as people who have seen movies before um, that something is, you know, he's been poisoned or something. And so he's doing that, you know. No, but you must know that the... Yes. Oh, yeah. like... And uh, a nurse starts approaching him to kick out David. And then the uh, it ends with him stammering... Uh, uh, the German called the woman, like you just said, like, you know, John Cleese, do, do, <laughs> do what, do what, do drop. Oh. And yeah. So that's, that's how it ends as the, uh, we learned that do drop is the, is the hooker that we're looking for. I used to do that to my kids when they were little to annoy them, to tell them that, uh, I'm, I'm dying. You know, you're just messing around on the, on the ground or whatever, <laughs> wrestling. And then I go, you, you killed me. The money's in the. Uh, it's like slap my face. Dad, dad. There's millions, millions of dollars. And all you need to know is, and just do it for ten minutes until they be screaming, "Stop it! Stop it!" Dad, tell me where the money is so I can return it to the NSA. Yes. Oh, I can't believe he actually used that. There's one in a. It reminded me of a. Uh, my dad used to love the Pink Panther movies. There's one where there's a uh, a cross dressing butler, like you know the butler did it, mm -hmm. and he's suspected. So he follows him, and it turns out that he does a drag act at a at a gay nightclub. Okay, <laughs> and so he go, he gets shot by the bad guys, and he comes into his dressing room, and he's still in like his wig and everything. And Clouseau, oh bends, Clouseau bends down. He's like, it, it was yes, yes, 
the exact same thing that's happening here. And then he, <laughs> he goes down to listen to him and the guy reaches up and kisses him. And that's, his Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> but wow. that's what it reminded me of just like a stupid comic yeah the moment. dumbest broadest comedy yes wow oh yeah. man all right well well done dan brown for uh <laughs> triggering those uh those type of memories from that well we i think we have to move it along pretty quickly because we were hitting the uh, old two hour mark but we can do some dumb sentences maybe a choice email or two a sentence begins with a capital letter a capital letter is a letter that's big a capital letter is not a small letter Capital letter. That's yeah, long, but what else are we going to do? <laughs> we got some dumb sentences of the week, many of them submitted by our Patreon supporters over at patreon.com slash 372 pages. Go on over there. You can listen to the uh, rapidly descending into utter chaos and madness quarantine minis we've been posting. Mm-hmm. And uh, to uh, take part in getting every episode early and contests, etc. It's a lot of fun, and we appreciate everyone who does it. But uh, here's the dumb sentences. Hale, uh, this is from Zach. Hale arched a surprised eyebrow. He says it's short and sweet and posits the existence of sentient facial features. <laughs> we had uh, Matt and Curtis gave us uh, Lieutenant looked offended in the way only a Spaniard can be offended. There we go. Yep. Uh, Lucas submitted on the wall. This is of the hospital. On the wall, a basketball hoop hung limply from its backboard. If it's the basketball hoop and not the net that's limp, I'd like to know what material it's made of. <laughs> Um, just he's mixing his metaphors there again. Mm -hmm. Uh, Khan submitted the lieutenant shocked. You're not going to experience Seville. Um, <laughs> Braden submitted, uh, this, uh, this one from the person with 170 IQ, a defective heart could kill him just like that. Um, so I guess she's just, uh, her IQ is in the code breaking realm, but not the basic anatomy. Um, George submitted, yeah, he depended heavily on his computer while devising and revising his plans. I think that's with his uh, system software. Um, brainstorm? Or, uh, yes, brainstorm. <laughs> uh, John uh, submitted Solo El Escroto, which stands alone very well. Um, sure. Uh, Patrick submitted, whether he's sleeping, showering, or eating, the passkey would always be with him, ready at a moment's <laughs> notice for instant publication. And he took a different exception to that. He'd less of an infomercial and more, except for that it was a ring. He was in the shower and the thing standing in his way would not, would be not being at a terminal and being wet or being asleep. <laughs> right. uh, so it's, uh, yeah, pretty damn dumb. Uh, this is from Naram. It appeared as usual that he had found fl favor with the Shikigosan, the seven deities of good luck. And uh, Nerum explains, I think that's Numa Numa guy. Nerum explained why this sentence? Because the seven deities of good luck are the Shikafukujian. Shikigosian is a festival for little kids to celebrate growing up. Wow. It's as flat out bad re research as it gets. I didn't I'm even look that up again. It's like with the uh, Columbus's scrotum. You just go, that's so stupid that I'm not going to waste right. time on it. It must yep. be a thing. And he's just... Supposed to be color, obviously, but wow. Yeah, I know. I'm glad we have so many uh, Japanese uh, people yeah. who are down with the uh, m minutia of the culture that can fill us in on this because it's very funny. Um, the next one, uh, this is from Tris. Catholicism, he's referring to Spain. Catholicism was bigger here than in Vatican City. He says, yeah, what, that, do you mean, that, what do you mean I bigger? Very dumb sentence. <laughs> Just say that Spain is a very Catholic country without going into stupid territory. Like, yes. you know. That's uh, who's bigger in Denver, Kelly LeBrock or Kim Basinger? <laughs> uh, Andrew submitted, is the NSA, this is uh, Susan saying this, is the NSA tapping my phone? Susan works for the NSA who are monitoring all of the data on the internet and all of the emails. Of course, they are checking your phone calls too. Like, what do you need to, how did that need to be something you were told? Um, Tom submitted, it was designed to feel like home. Plush carpets, high-tech sound system, fully stocked fridge, kitchenette, Nerf basketball hoop. He said, so the code breakers are 12-year-old boys who happen to be fond of plush carpeting. I have a couple that did not get burned. I don't know if you... Uh... Oh, I guess I just have one. Uh, if the NSA can put five... This is all one sentence. If the NSA can put five rhyolite satellites in geosynchronous orbit over the Mideast, I think it's safe to assume we have the resources to pay off a few Spanish policemen. <laughs> that's a, that's I, did, the I didn't mark it as a dumb sentence, but that, that does stick out in my mind. It, it's, uh, you know, it's just about as catchy as the, the traditional one of that. Like, if we can put a man on the moon, we should be able to get this 
tax website. I don't know. That sort of that's they, the what he was going for. But there was a uh, a, a joke. I don't know whether this was a stand-up comedy or, or I read it or something. Maybe Frank Conniff told it to me years ago that he knew someone who said it. They can kill the Kennedys. Why can't they make a decent cup of coffee or something, <laughs> something like that? <laughs> Just an absurdity. Um, Real vey. Yeah. I, uh, so, yeah, my dumb sentences got burned. Okay. Well, then let's but we had our... plenty of them. We're good. Oh man, yeah. This is uh, just it's riches. Like again, like after Shadow Moon, it's just so nice to be able to delve into a book that has treats like that around every corner. And indeed, you know. Uh, but let's do some quick emails. We go to the party. We go to the game. We go to the dinner. Gonna cruise out, man. Mm-hmm. 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 What do you got? Oh, we got a lot of good ones, so maybe we'll have to do some other ones later. Um, we got Daniel who wrote in and saying that in his UK copy of the book, the reference to uh, Estee Lauder had been removed. What? Yep. It was just, uh, it had her just completely not there. Um, so he thought maybe it was a product placement restriction or something like that. But, oh, uh, yeah. Has to be. <laughs> it's like uh, the, Dust- the Kinks uh, uh, Lola was yeah. censored because it mentioned Coca-Cola, not because really? it was about a transvestite. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> That's bizarre. Mm-hmm. Uh, Dustin wrote in, said, I couldn't find a free ebook version of Digital Fortress on the library app, so I settled for the audiobook. I was very confused when I started listening to this last podcast because it turns out the bulk of the horniness has been edited out of the audiobook. What? No, des- no descriptions of firm breasts and flat stomachs, no s- creepy security guards ogling her legs, no drinking fountain baths or celeb- sub- celebratory bagels. In fact, what I listened to wasn't great, but I wasn't sure you would get enough to make fun of. Turns out, editing the book sh- you should. Turns out, the editing the book should have had was saved for the audiobook. It's still bad, though. Was so? Was it done years later and like cooler minds prevailed? Like we I obviously don't know. can't release this garbage. Yeah, that's a really good question. It could have been after. You know, this was before his biggest bestseller, so maybe they, uh, maybe they. Took it out since I don't feel like that was in the Da Vinci Code, all yeah, the horniness. Yeah, maybe they said, we don't want you to see this Dan Brown. Yeah. <laughs> this is our new uh, Dan Brown 2.0, who's not a horny right. <laughs> Uh But Jennifer had a, a succinct, definite dis- description. This whole book describing sex or Susan is basically just the Oh, oh Yeah song by Ye- Yellow from Ferris Bueller. <laughs> and yep, that is sunglasses being tilted down. Yep. Yeah. Uh, Mike, uh, weighed in. He is a lot of our, lis- our listeners have, have started getting ads for the, uh, Dan Brown masterclass, um, in their, I think, uh, Facebook and Instagram feeds. I've gotten them myself. What? But, Does he <laughs> host some sort of live? Yeah. To, masterclasses are, yeah, are like, you know, I think a lot of people have done, you know, music production or speech writing, yeah, comedy. Of course, yeah. Uh, but he, Mike had a subscription, I guess. So he watched a few of them. He said, I watched the first few masterclass lessons. Be on the lookout for Dan's three C's, the contract, the crucible, and the clock. The contract is the promise that Dan Brown will pay off all the questions asked in the novel. I sincerely doubt that. The crucible is the, I mean, especially since our questions are mostly about vicious law and stuff like that. Yes. The, the crucible is the hero just can't walk away. She or he needs no way out but to solve the problem. Yep. And the clock had in a fountain. Got to do yes. it. Yep. <laughs> and the clock makes the hero solve it quickly. So see how well he pays those off in Digital Fortress. Hint: not well. Uh, well, so. does that even apply to uh, the Da Vinci Code? Isn't that movie like three and a half hours long or something? Uh, so the yeah, clock, I, I guess, is <laughs> is pretty flexible. <laughs> um i think someone else watched it and says that dan brown's master classes are, are very short compared to other people who are offering them too so that's maybe the clock is is working in his favor there in terms of yeah i'll do this but i'm not going to take and spend much time or effort on it right yeah, uh, i think of master classes is, as you know uh, daniel barenboim or something uh doing teaching people piano and stuff not dan brown like <laughs> talking about flat stomachs and firm yeah. breasts here's how to crap out a bestseller you <laughs> yes. should consider one based on your quarantine minis on uh, classical music oh yeah that's true yeah. final email is from michael i asked you know, this is funny because it's the classic uh friend's da- uncle who works for nintendo or uh canadian girlfriend asked my friend who currently works in the nsa <laughs> <laughs> uh about the cafeteria he said, it's your standard office cafeteria and overpriced because there's no competition. No, <laughs> they never have prime rid or vicious swah. <laughs> he also described Digital Fortress as laughably wrong. So um, <laughs> finally some confirmation. That comports. That makes sense. Uh, that's it for me, uh, for, for our emails. Uh, we got a lot of them, but uh, we'll do a mailbag maybe later on. 
Yeah. All right. We'll pick up on this. People seem to be excited by digital, digital fortress. What do you call him? Digital boy? What digital? Bobby Digital. Bobby Digital. Sorry. Bobby, Bobby, Bobby. Digi, Digi, Digi. Okay. Well, people, sorry that we ran a little long, but look, Connor and I haven't had any time together at all. And so it's been good to just catch up and just. Just wallow in each other's company, Connor. <laughs> if you and I speak after this, I'll be shocked. I know. Oh, man. No, not a chance. We're done. You and we're I, we're done professionally. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Uh, we'll post the uh, the description in the uh, or the next assignment in the notes. All right. Sounds good. This is 372 pages. We'll never get back. Michael J. Nelson signing off. Connor Lestoka. Talk to you later. Bye. So long.